Do we want to have a Kardashian minute? No. No? No. This week on Backward Compatible, Jim and Chris discuss the pros and cons of performance and game development. Plus, a related discussion on SAC after strike authorization and more geeking out over the Phantom Pain. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Backward Compatible. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 47 of the BackwardCompatible.com podcast. I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Yep, I'm back. And Doc will not be joining us today because he has things going on, so today's just me and Jim. Uh, and in a... Uh... Wait, don't turn it off just yet. <laughs> Keep listening. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Got a good show for you. We, we know you guys all come here for Doc, but you know, we're, we try, you know, we're here. <laughs> We do things, but... Uh, and, and for those of you that skipped last week's episode because I wasn't involved, welcome back. This is, uh, that one was low sodium. <laughs> for the one person. Yeah. That, that one was low sodium, but now we're back with a uh, full sodium. Uh, I don't know if you really label anything full sodium, but you just sort of make it the product that's not labeled low sodium. Hypertension. But there you go. <laughs> hypertension. <laughs> Backward compatible hypertension. Yes. So, uh, as we sip on our uh, Deep Ellum IPAs, very tasty brews. Yeah, we have a couple of Deep Ellum IPAs here. Uh, Deep Ellum is a local uh, brewery here in Dallas, mm. and they do make some pretty good beer. Muy delicioso. Um, our meaty topic for tonight will be performance in games, mm. the good and the bad. Ah. We have a lot to talk about in this one. Will we have the ugly this time? Uh, I don't know about the ugly, mm. but we are going to be looking at both sides uh, of the issue and how it's both. it can be good, it can be bad, and how it is used in games and sometimes abused in games. So, all right, let's get started. Let's mosh. Ready for the butt mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. Chris, I don't know about you, but I am still playing through Metal Gear Solid 5. I am when I can. Yeah, same with me. I'm still working my way through it slowly. I'm at about, I believe, 37 or 38%. I forgot to check my hours uh, before we started, but I'm sure I've, I've at least reached 50, if not gone beyond it. I've done a lot of side, side missions or side ops, I should say, but in terms of missions, I've only just recently completed mission 30, mm -hmm. and I will say there are uh, about, what, 50 or 60 missions in the game? I, I, if I had to guess, I'd say so, yeah. Okay, and uh, so I'm, I'm over, probably about over the halfway mark by a little bit, mm -hmm. and in mission 30, I will mm -hmm. mention that you do confront Skullface, at least that is the way the mission is presented, mm -hmm. and that's all I'll say to avoid spoilers. Mm -hmm. Chris, where are you in Metal Gear? I'm in about the same place, actually, um, and from my understanding, this is basically the wrap-up to Chapter 1, uh, Act 1, oh, if you wow. will, um, and then there's going to be Chapter 2. I don't think there's a Chapter 3, as far as I'm aware. There was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. I've heard that's, that's they found heard. Chapter 3 on the disc, mm -hmm. Chapter 3 was originally um, going to be called Peace, which mm -hmm. has an interesting name to it. I really hope that Kojima, in his last few months contracted to Konami has been secretly working on this and it's going to come out as DLC and honestly even if we have to pay for it I'm okay with that oh I will pay for it yeah. I will I will pay a full I'll put this out there right now Konami I will pay a full $60 for another like a version of similar to Ground Zeroes where it's a standalone game but I'll pay 60 freaking bucks for it oh like the uh, game of the year edition sort of thing that yes. has chapter 3 added I'll do it but you gotta put it out yeah. you have to <laughs> actually put it out sure so we're later on, we'll be talking about how much I hate microtransactions <laughs> at the end of some of the DLC stuff. But yeah. guess what? I'll pay for this. I'll yeah. pay if it's good enough. Yeah. If it's actual meaty content, mm. and it's, it's, it's curated by like one of the best, in my opinion, one of the best uh, game designers mm. that is still alive today... I'll pay for it. We'll make the uh, the MGS Phantom Pain pledge, right? Yes. And actually, you know what we should do? You know all those like really stupid uh, change.org petitions people put out there? Mm -hmm. We should go on change.org and get like you know 5,000 people to sign the petition for uh, somehow... In some way, force the or have the U.S. government force Konami to finish Phantom Pain. Yes, because that's that's totally how it works. Well, that's how Change.org <laughs> works. It's basically, if if your petition succeeds on Change.org, then the U.S. government will will force it to happen. Force it, that's, except not at all. That's no. not how Change, it works. Change.org doesn't do anything. I think the thing is that if it reaches a certain number, it is looked at by someone, and mm. then maybe carried forward. The emphasis on the maybe. No, I think they look at it. They just like it's like picking up a piece of paper. They pick it up. They turn it over, they, and they just put it right back down again. <laughs> Face palm, yeah. slide it into the incinerator chute. It's like, and, wait, uh, will, this, will this make me rich? 
No? Okay, pass. <laughs> um, okay, so, uh, uh, but any, any other impressions beyond just still enjoying the game? Because I, I know we mentioned before when we started, uh, something I wanted to talk about is there's a shift around mission uh, in the mid-20s somewhere, maybe a little later 20s, maybe like 27, 28. But yeah. there gets to a point where suddenly the missions become to be continued. Yeah. And I'm assuming that's going to stop. Mm. I think it's a build-up to the end of that, cha- I that think first so. chapter. It's, I, I agree with you. It feels like mm. I'm getting close to the end of that first chapter. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it's even though I like the way that the story is being presented, one of the problems with this is that it, it, it really kind of takes you out of the experience yes. from a story flow perspective. Mm. Because now, uh, and I get why they do it, by the way, it's mm-hmm. because... To an extent, if you're starting a mission and in, in one mission you uh, you've set yourself up for stealth, yeah. and then the second part you now suddenly change your loadout. yeah suddenly you've got a boss fight. Mm-hmm. That being said, they do have supply drops. They mm-hmm. could have designed the missions in such a way that that they would just save in between. Because mm-hmm. I understand you also don't want to be playing a mission for like five hours. Yeah, yeah, so you still have to have save points in between that kind of thing. But it would have to be when you 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 would have to essentially start from in the middle of that mission. You can't just go back to your helicopter and do yeah. a side op. Because sure. I did. I went back. I did the whole. Mm-hmm. Um, did you fight Eli uh, on the, on I the did. boat? On the sh- on I did. On the uh, tanker? Mm-hmm. So, Interesting fight. Do you, have, you, have you any guesses on who what his identity is? Because I'm pretty sure I know. Liquid! Yeah. It, it was pretty obvious when you, yeah. when you first see him. Yeah. In fact, even when they're talking about him as a soldier, mm-hmm. as like White Mamba, yeah. I'm already kind of thinking, it could be. Mm-hmm. And, it, and, it, and it does definitely seem like it's it, it's not even really a spoiler at this point. Once you meet this character, like oh yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's got to be liquid. And like you know, I, I um, liquid snake. I, yeah. I I I mentioned that my brother's been playing through it, or he has played through it, and so I was uh, I got spoiled as to a few cutscenes here and there. Mm-hmm. And this doesn't spoil too much to the main plot, but there's a scene where Eli and one of his uh, friends are walking around Mother Base. And this kid's telling a story about his dad working in the mines, and then like basically Eli just comes like full on with the daddy issues. It's like, oh, you're talking about how much you love your dad. You must really love having a dad, huh? It's like, <laughs> okay, yep, it's definitely him. <laughs> so. um, but yeah, but getting getting back to the the um, that sort of like mission break, that story, that narrative break rather. Um, I will say that's one of the. I, I would honestly say that's the only real flaw that I've had in the game. Like that I can really identify, aside from, like, nitpicky things here and there about mm. certain boss fights, I'm sorry, boss fights, mm. where you're not sure what sort of loadout to go with. Um, I'm specifically talking about, I want to say it was maybe Mission 28 or 29, where you fight a whole bunch of ghosts. Mm. I'm sure you know the one I'm talking about. It's really very difficult. You mm. find a bunch of, like, the cypher, you know, the ghost s- agents or whatever you call them. The, the snipers? No, they're all wearing these... The, the skulls? Yeah, the skulls mm. with the suits that are really hard to kill. Oh, right. And there's a ton of them around you, mm. and you're just basically, like... Cause you're Is that hel- the one you're trying to get the truck out? No, so when your helicopter crashes, mm. you, you just have saved oh, yeah, Kotok. Or you, yeah, it's really, yeah. that was the only mission I've actually struck, really struggled mm-hmm. with. And the main reason that I struggled with was because I didn't know what loadout to go with. Sure. This whole time, I've been doing nothing but stealthy, and, st- and now all of a sudden mm. I have to fight these guys that are really hard to kill. Mm. So eventually, I just, I, you know, fed up D-Walker, which I hadn't even used to that point, because mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, he's a mech, I'll use him. And the first time I used D-Walker in the entire game... <laughs> And barely, I had like one upgrade to one of his equipment, like just the wept uh, chain gun. Mm. And I rolled that mission. It That's wasn't a challenge in a few, huh. and very quickly I got S rank. Interesting. Versus my previous like five or six times mm. playing it and being extremely frustrated and like trying all these tricks mm. and just dying all the time. I think I did it like two times, yeah. and the way I did it is I had a. Well, tank. aren't you fancy? Yes, I know. <laughs> uh, I had a tank that oh, I played with. That's, that's um, a good idea, too. I, I also brought Quiet, um, and so whenever I wasn't attacking, she was headshotting people. Mm-hmm. Um, so that helped. Uh, and so basically, between her slowly whittling them down and me occasionally, because they have this thing with like the, uh, what they call it, Metal Arcana. Yeah. Um, they are able to uh, stop your vehicles. And so if you get too close to them for yes. too long, they'll stop your vehicle. I, I was noticing that with my D-Walker. It would start to slow down. and like, mm-hmm. But but I had um, Ocelot talking to me, telling me, like, uh, well, watch out for the, mm-hmm. you know, don't don't get in that mist. It'll stop your walker. So I just, yeah. like, run off. Mm-hmm. It was smoking because initially it took me a bit to, to like, learn how to use it because I, I had never used it before. Yeah. And so it got smoky and sparky initially, so I thought it was about to blow up. And I did get knocked out of it a couple of times, but... Otherwise, I got right back in it, kept shooting, and it was actually a surprisingly easy mission with mm-hmm. D-Walker. Like I, I said, I actually wish, got strength. I kind of wish there's actually a little bit, like, they they give you the chance to use a D-Walker when you um, extract, um, what's his name? I'm going blank. The, the scientist. Huey. Huey. Huey yeah, when, when you extract yeah. Huey. Um, and 
Um, in that sense, they're kind of like, and it, it makes sense because they're throwing you into something. You don't know how it works. Mm-hmm. Um, but you can use it at any point after that. Yeah. But it'd be cool if they had like a training mission, like even on Mother Base, where they said, okay, press these buttons and do these things mm-hmm. in the same way they taught you at Mother Base. Like, here's how you knock the guy out, and here's how you fault him, and lots sort of stuff. That's do, true. do a training mission so you learn the controls and learn how it works, because they say that it's meant as an actual infiltration thing. Like, you can actually equip it so that it steps silently. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can equip it with like tranquilizer guns. You can, like I've seen it, and, and, and so you totally you can, can. You can totally play. It's totally viable. Yeah, you can play like as D Walker, yeah. you know, doing stealth missions. But I just have never really do, done it. Do we want to talk? Well, I mean, to mention, I mean, it should be obvious, but um, that Ko- Kojima is a really big, obviously a big Mecha fan. Like he mm-hmm. loves Mecha. He's a huge fan. I mean, obviously Metal Gear, of course, has different Mecha designs in them. But even before Metal Gear, he was doing things with with mechs and mm-hmm. tanks. And when you do the introduction for each of the missions, they have, of course, the cinematic opening. Mm-hmm. And when it, he always goes through and says what characters are in it, mm-hmm. but he also says what mechs are in it. Yeah. And that includes things like tanks mm-hmm. or helicopters. It's very it's very cool how mm-hmm. he, he he basically gives them to- equal billing yeah. with the characters. Yeah. And what's cool about that too, though, is that it actually gives you a way um, if you figure you need to go back later and collect vehicles and stuff from other. Base, yeah, you can be point. like, oh, on that mission there was that tank. I can go back and get that tank. Mm-hmm. So, That's actually a very good point. Yeah, um, but yeah, that was a smart move playing, using the tank. And mm-hmm. and uh, but yeah, I, I ended up just using D Walker. I don't think I don't think I had, no, I had captured a tank at that point. I just didn't want it. I think I had had it in one of my rollout missions. Which, by the way, that was the, one of the only missions I actually failed the <laughs> the, the combat deployments. Mm. I actually failed one. Uh, I didn't even realize you could fail one. <laughs> yeah, well, because I think those. Uh, are you talking about the one? Um, where Mother Base gets raided? No, there's one where you can send them to, like, go fight oh, someone that, after right, that. Yes. It's like a B-ranked difficulty, and yeah. I still had, like, a 90% chance to succeed, and I still failed. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I was like, what is this nonsense? But I'll, 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 I'm sure I'll do it again. No, the one where it got raided was pretty cool. I was actually in the middle of a mission, mm-hmm. and I had just started it, and it's like, you gotta come back. Yeah. And I came back, and then I... That was their way of introducing you to the um, Ford operating bases. Or rather, it sets up the Ford mm-hmm. operating bases, which I don't know if you've been playing in online or offline mode. I've, I've, um, I think I'm technically... Online, in the sense that I, you're connected to the I'm connected servers, to the, in, the servers, but I'm not really trying to play online. I don't really want anyone rating my. To be yeah. honest, I'm just not that interested in, in Metal Gear yeah. Online. I, I don't know. If, I mean, I'm probably going to try it because I have the game. Well, online but, and the FOBs are two different things. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, online is like I think it's actually a separate download. Um, as, long, as long as you own Fan and Pain, you can get it. Mm-hmm. But it's a separate download, a separate game. Um, whereas the FOB missions are, you have a Ford operating base, and it's kind of their way of introducing microtransactions to the game, which we'll get to later. Yeah. Um, where they want you, like, you get the first base for free, and you get perks for having these bases, but they want you to... And you can get more people on your base, on yeah. your, in your team. Too. Exactly, yeah. Which, you get that first one for free, and I know mm-hmm. I thought it was great, now I can start upgrading. Mm-hmm. Um, quick question about that, by the way. If someone raids your base, can they actually destroy it so that you knock it down from, like, a level 2 to level 1? That I don't know. Because um, so, Because I've been in offline mode. Screw that. Yeah. I do screw know you can that. lose personnel and you can lose resources. I, I don't know if you can. Too. I don't know if you can lose the base. Can you only... Can you... Do you lose resources? How, how do you know who's assigned to what? Uh, who's assigned to FOB and who's assigned to your main base? Uh, I am. I would imagine you that there's... Anyone? There's probably... In the same way you've got, like, the staff listings, like, who's yeah. in which platform there's probably also like switch bases okay. if i had to guess but i haven't played it so we talked a bit about the at the beginning about um kojima and female characters and all that i don't want to go into all that discussion because we've had that before in the podcast but i did want to mention um i do think it's interesting how there are some female soldiers that are in the game in the field that you can extract and have on your team yeah then of course you could ta- you could play as that female soldier as yeah. well because i've heard some people complain that you can't play as quiet which of course you can't because she's a buddy she's mm-hmm. not meant to be playable yeah but you can play as these female soldiers. So there are actually female soldiers you can play as um, in this game. I think it's kind of a nice touch. Mm-hmm. And I also like that they're that they're actually pretty rare, mm-hmm. which I think is also pretty realistic. Yeah. So most of the soldiers are men, but there are some female soldiers out there, and some of them have really good stats. Yeah. You find and usually um, the first one I found was, I think actually she was the first one I found. It was, I want to say during the the mission where you're going to stop uh, the White Mamba. Mm. Where you know she was like inside one of these houses, and you rescue her, and she actually turned out to have pretty good stats. I think there are a few before that. There may um, have been, yeah. And I, and I could have also rescued one before that, mm-hmm. but that was the one that I that sticks out mm-hmm. as most recent. Because I think I think the one that you rescued during the White Mamba oh. mission was better at combat. Yeah, than I think the one the first one. Yes, had. I remember. You're right. Actually, I remember now. There was like some. There was some um, mm-hmm. intel. Mm-hmm. One that was really good at intel earlier on. I and think there was, was also it, like um, a, a scientist. Not scientist. A medical person mm-hmm. as well. That was like. I think the first one you get on Mother Base is like Laughing Wallaby. Uh huh. The first one you. 
you can get. I'm not sure about that, but but you're right. I think this was the first that was like really good at combat. That is even a viable option. Mm-hmm. Um, I will throw this out there though. I have never played as anyone else other than Snake. Neither have I. Yeah, and I don't really care to. It's totally cool that people do, and I'm sure there's people that love doing that. But personally, I like being Snake. I think. The thing that would be more interesting to me, and there are special abilities that some of them have that Snake might not necessarily. Oh, very true. Um, like, you know, for instance, one of them I remember is, like, really good at climbing. And yes. So you can climb really quickly. Some, um, some are supposed to be have a little bit faster reflexes or a little are, bit longer mm-hmm. uh, time when they're in reflex mode. And some of them are a little bit more resilient, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, something I think would be really interesting is if the fact that you are having to fly from Mother Base to the mission areas and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. They kind of just, like, abstract that out with, you know, fades, basically. But there is still, like, you, you pick your missions from your helicopter and you're in that, that operating field, yeah. and then you get dropped down. I think it'd be really cool if, actually, say, Snake is deployed on a mission, and while he's in transit, you can do another mission um, with someone else, in the same way they have, like, deployment times. Mm-hmm. Um, or rather, like, even if you, you want to play just as nothing but Snake, there's still in-game time that passes... Yeah. Um, in a meaningful way, like things will actually happen like within like three days in game time. Um, and so if you are only working with Snake, it could be possible, for instance, that while Snake is doing mission in Afghanistan, it would take him, you know, say a full day to fly back from Afghanistan to Mother Base to Africa. Mm-hmm. You can instead just deploy someone to so, Africa and do something the same day. So let me do let me let me take that idea and I think I think do you one better, but I, mm. I like I like the basis of the idea. But here's what I think: mm. we were talking about how the fl- the narrative flow gets broken by having these to be continued missions. Mm. What if we keep that to be continued concept, and you still go back to the to the helicopter uh, or to mother base or whatever, and you can call the helicopter, and you can choose to be one of your soldiers, mm. which you can always be, because Snake is busy on these really this really long continued mission yeah. where his helicopter crashes and he goes through all this thing and then he goes and tries to try the skull face. You got all these to be continued stuff, mm-hmm. so let him do that. And if you want to play a Snake, you have to continue that mission from the ground, not from the helicopter. Yeah. But if you want to do other side ops, if you still want to do side ops, you can do that mm-hmm. as one of your soldiers. Yeah. So it's kind of like taking kind of both of those ideas, and I think it, I'm sure that these are not going to be the only part where you have a to be continued segment. Mm-hmm. I think that could be pretty a pretty neat thing. Yeah. So mm-hmm. working that in and. <clears throat> Excuse me. Working that in and then having some sort of like, I think real, like quote unquote real time base management would be really cool too, where you have to like manage who is where to make sure things are happening as efficiently as possible. That could be pretty cool. The one, the one issue with that is that that adds an extra game element that some people may not want to play. True. Good point. Um, so, I mean, I'd probably get kind of obsessed with it because I like those, I like the micromanaging aspect of, of making like the best base possible and all yeah. this kind of stuff. But it does add an extra thing that you might risk alienating people. There could possibly be some sort of, mm-hmm. like, um, turn that mode on and off kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know how they would handle that. But it's an interesting idea. It's mm-hmm. definitely an interesting idea. I, I could see it being, I, I like could certainly see enjoying an it. An alternate so. game mode where, like, after you beat it the first time, yeah. play through again. But now you also have to worry about um, you only have, like, three days in-game time to complete a mission. Mm-hmm. And then have consequences for a failure, like, not finishing said mission. So... Well, I think if it's a main mission, you kind of have to let them. Oh, a main mission. Try sure. it again, but. but but there are ways that you can sort of add urgency on certain missions that aren't mm-hmm. essential to the plot. Um, well, you can also forget the whole not even trying again. You could literally just have it's a game over screen. You know, mm-hmm. you technically just do that. Let them try it again, but they have to start from the beginning in terms of mission progress. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, there's checkpoints. Mm-hmm. Technically, take that away if you wanted to. Make it so you can't go back to a checkpoint on these missions. Mm-hmm. Now you you have to beat them in one time, one time through. Another or start small at the beginning. another small quip I have with the game, and like we're, we're and I like checkpoints by the way. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying take out checkpoints. Oh yeah, sure. there's definitely some things where you don't know mm-hmm. that it's going to happen because you get kind of blindsided by mm-hmm. bullshit. That does happen occasionally in this mm-hmm. game, I will admit. So yeah. I guess that I do have a little qualms with, with, with we're, that. We're, we're getting a little bit nitpicky with a really awesome game. Oh, no, we are. It's, uh, uh, but something that I really wish you could do is when you're just doing side ops, um, get dropped in by your helicopter, and then rather than having to run or drive or whatever the two kilometers to the other part of the field where another side op is, just call in your helicopter and just to take a hop the same way you can on Mother Base. Yeah. Um, the fact that anytime you get on the hol- helicopter means you're going back up to... The thing it's like it's it's not really that big a difference technically, but what it does mean is that um, you are taking extra time for loading and stuff like that. Where you could just save with saying, "Look, all I want is a lift from here to two kilometers away." Yes, so I can just drop in and do another side op. You know, I agree. We talked a lot about Metal Gear, but it's a great game, so please play it. <laughs> um, uh, because because poor Konami is just suffering so much. Uh, no, okay. So moving on.
And now it's time for Let's Watch Let's Plays, the part of our show about games, about shows about games. So the Game Grumps recently have been, uh, and the Game Grumps are kind of my go-to Let's Play channel. I don't watch them all the time, but when I do watch Let's Plays, it's usually with the Grumps. Um, and recently they're playing uh, Super Mario Maker. And what they're doing essentially is the Danny and Aaron, who are the two main Game Grumps on the Game Grumps series, um, they've got a whole bunch of different spin-off shows now, are playing through levels that uh, Ross has designed. Ross is one of the other Game Grumps guys. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they, as they talk about on the show, Ross is a little bit... Um, uh, is sadistic the word I'm looking for? Yeah, possibly. I don't know where you're going <laughs> with it. But, uh, but basically, um, they, they tell a funny anecdote, actually, about how... Um, like they were looking at the definition of like sadism and how you know it's like deriving pleasure from someone else's pain and Ross just kind of exclaims like almost a matter of fact like oh I do that <laughs> and so uh, what they're doing is they're playing through all these levels that Ross has designed in Super Mario Maker and they're specifically designed um, they are winnable mm -hmm. but they're designed to be as difficult as possible it's very like you know I want to be the guy uh, sort of masochistic sort yeah. of game design um, and very punishing. And it's, it's funny to watch because they'll basically spend an episode or two just trying over and over and over again to master a level. Um, but it, I just thought it was a... So how sadistic? Is it like just... Is it, bas it basically just makes it ridiculous? I kind of yeah. hate games that do that because mm -hmm. I think, honestly, I think it's, it's bullshit. <laughs> but um, more power to people that want to play them completely. Yeah. I mean, I, I like that Mario Maker gives you all these options. Have you played Mario Maker? I have not yet, but I definitely... Okay. Need Excuse me. I definitely need to, and I can afford to get it. Yeah, I don't. I don't have a Wii U. I've been thinking of getting one. The only thing that's holding me back is that uh, Nintendo's Nintendo. What is it? NX. Yeah, the NX code name. Just, I'm not sure if they're going to announce that soon, and like when it might come. Mm -hmm. So it makes me feel like maybe I should wait. I don't know. It, my guess um, is going to be that if they announce it, it will be at this coming E3. When, um, is, when is that? May in June. Early June. June. That's like uh, wait. We've already had June. June has already happened. This coming June. So later, another year? Okay, I don't know if I can wait that long. Uh, it, it might be, it's, it's going to be like eight months. I have this realization. June has already happened. Yeah. Uh, okay, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I've only only had a few sips of this beer, by the way, so I just don't know. Um, that's not why I forgot about June. No, I, I knew about June. I was just, you know, I was realizing that it was so far away. But, you don't know about June. Yeah. It's time for War Stories. Tales of Tribulation and Triumph in Gaming. Uh, this is a sort of an, I guess, a non-traditional game, but I do believe that it does fit. Mm -hmm. um, I have been playing since um, I am currently employed, so I, I've been playing fantasy football with people that I work with. A work league? A work league, yes. Very nice. Uh, it's a $20 work league, so you mm -hmm. can pay $20 to be in this league. And there's a pot at the end for whoever wins. There's a pot at the end for everyone, and it is a 12-person league. Mm -hmm. Uh, half point PPR for those who know that is a like points per reception. Yeah, right. I've never so, played PPR. Yeah, it's, I, think I think it's, more, I think I think it's fair. Mm -hmm. I mean, to half full point might be a little much, mm -hmm. but I think half point is part of the game. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but anyway, so the the idea behind uh, the reason why I bring up this segment is because I have not really watched or followed pro football for a few years now. Um, I actually am a sports guy. I do watch various sporting events. I really got into the NBA, NBA uh, uh, playoffs again, kind of got back into NBA. I grew up with NBA. Um, I grew up with NFL, too. I've just stopped. I'm still into college football and college mm -hmm. sports. but And, of course, I love soccer. I, I watch a lot of soccer. But NFL is something I've kind of moved away from. Mm -hmm. So when they asked me to join the league, this was months before the the season has started when I'd only been in the company for about a month. Mm -hmm. So to me, I'm like, oh, this will be a good way to bond with my workers, mm -hmm. you know, kind of do a little bit of trash talk, have some fun. Sure. But I wasn't expecting to win. I just didn't want to get embarrassed. Mm -hmm. So what do I do as a gamer? Well, of course, I try to game the system. I try to use, look look at all the stats, take in all the information, try to figure out how can I win this yeah. without, you know, how can, I, how can I win? How can I do the best possible that I can, even though maybe I don't have a background in playing this before, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, well... I've been doing quite well for myself. So I'm currently 4-0, mm -hmm. um, and I've actually had the biggest blowout of the week, every week except for one. Mm -hmm. uh, on week two, in particular, I won by um, 89 points. 
Very nice. And I think it might be worth explaining <laughs> to, to those people at home who have played fantasy football um, how it works, basically. Yeah. Um, it's a head-to-head system, essentially. Yeah, they, they you build up a team, you fill each of the positions on your team mm-hmm. with a real-life player, yes. and each week they track the performance of that player, they track their stats. Yes, and you get, and you get different points based mm-hmm. on things yeah. like, for quarterbacks, you get points, obviously you get points for touchdowns, and everyone does. Yeah. But you also get points for, obviously, uh, field goal kickers get points too. Completed which, passes, yes. yards gained, mm-hmm. all that sort of stuff. So we won't go into too much detail about, this, detail about the scoring, but it's more than just, like, did they score a touchdown? Yes. It's like, you know, how many yards did they there's a lot to it in performance, but it's yeah. not just about it's it's not just about did they score points. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, touchdowns or field goals. It's not yeah. just about that. There's more to it. Mm-hmm. I mean, there, you have to pick a defense. There's defense points and all yep. that. So there's a lot. There's a lot that goes into it. It's all statistic based, mm-hmm. um, which works out for me because I was able to figure out a great system going mm-hmm. forward. I drafted a pretty good team, and mm-hmm. then I just started picking up people off off um, waiver, which is like essentially players that no one owns. Yeah. You can make claims to. Mm. Um, it could also be something, someone that someone's released. Yes. And with the way waivers work is whichever team is doing worst, um, basically it's first dibs if they want to pick that person up. And if they basically decline, then it moves up in waivers. Yeah. And if they it's, clear waivers, basically if no one claims them, then they're free. Uh, they're fair game for anyone. Yeah, to. and ours actually doesn't do the whoever's doing worst or best. Okay. Because that is known as the communist system. And we uh. live in America. <laughs> so um, instead, what we do is a system of... Um, it's literally just order. Like, it goes in reverse draft order initially, but then after that, essentially every time you get someone off the waiver successfully, you go down to the bottom of the list. That makes sense. So it's literally just the in order. So okay. if, if you never pick anybody up, eventually you'll be the number one, but mm-hmm. once you become number one, now you're back down to 12. Gotcha. So it's literally just in order. Of course, that being said, I've made more moves than anybody else because mm-hmm. I'm constantly trying to make moves. Yeah. Nobody will trade with me, of course, because mm-hmm. I keep winning. Um, but yeah, they hate me. Yeah. Actually, it's funny. Like I actually made a, a really bad trade on purpose because I knew I could I could weather it, and it was not it was not terrible, but it was definitely disadvantageous to mm-hmm. me. Yeah, on purpose, hoping that it would get people to trade with me. Now mm-hmm. it didn't work. They still don't want to. Trade. <laughs> so it's very annoying. So I've gotten to the point now where I'm just helping other people make trades mm-hmm. that I think that I know their teams aren't that good, just to mess people up that are actually have pretty good teams. Mm-hmm. So. I'm, I'm obviously I'm trying to gain the system as much as I can, mm-hmm. but I will say that it is interesting that um, you can actually do. I think it almost hurts your chances if you watch a lot of mm-hmm. football games. And I, you, I can actually relate to that quite a bit. Yeah. I've only played like I'm not playing this season um, mm-hmm. just because of busyness, but um, I have played like two or three seasons of fantasy, fantasy football before, and um, it was interesting to me that the year I did the best was my first year playing mm-hmm. because I wasn't really that up with the league. Like, I knew a few players from the Cowboys because mm-hmm. I follow the Cowboys, but beyond that, I was just kind of, like, picking whoever seemed statistically best yeah. that, who, they, who was available. They're not, they're not names, they're numbers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And so it makes it, it, makes it easier to make mm-hmm. a choice. You don't, li- you don't necessarily like this guy. You yeah. just you like his numbers, and mm-hmm. you like his matchups based on these numbers. And the further you go along, the more you remember, like, oh, he did really well on points last year, I'm going to grab him. Unfortunately, a lot of times people who have really standout years can't repeat them. Mm-hmm. And so people go and pick the quote-unquote best players expecting a great performance, and then things like injury or not realizing that the team they're on isn't, gonna, isn't expected to do very well this year, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, in a way, like, there's some people who can look at the context of fantasy football, meaning, like, look at the real-world context and sort of know what that means for their performance. Right. But I think there are a lot of people, too, who uh, they look at it just enough that their uh, their their judgment's thrown off, you know? Yeah. They're, they're kind of... Uh, you, 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 sometimes you play a little bit too much with your with your heart and not enough with your head. Yes. We have a kitty here. Mm-hmm. I'm certainly not expecting to win now that everyone is t- intentionally... Like, I've actually been some trades that have gone through that I've tried to veto that it's very clear that it's like someone that's that he knows he's not going to win is trading to someone that actually has a chance to win to make his team better <laughs> uh-huh. just to mess me up. Nice. I can tell it's starting to happen. <laughs> so when you start to get that level of collusion, there's not a whole lot you can do. Yeah, yeah. At a certain point, I'm going to lose, if not now. I mean, I'm going to be in the playoffs, but if not now, I'll lose in the playoffs. Mm. But I can say this. Uh, at least I have bragging rights about having the, the biggest margin of victory. I don't think anyone's going to be able to top that. You never know, but I don't think anyone's going to be able to top that. It was quite huge. Very nice. Grab your salt shakers, because it's time for some reckless speculation. Mark's used to engage with rumors, hearsay, and all sorts of crazy theories. We've got some reckless speculation that we'd like to talk about. A game that is coming out very soon, uh, November, is it 10th or 11th? I think it's 11th. Okay. I could be wrong. But very soon. Um, less than a month? No, wait, more than a month. Never mm-hmm. mind. Um, Fallout 4. 
Yep. Fallout is a is a series that I remember from my youth playing the original all the way through. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've played every game in the series, and I'm actually a pretty big Fallout fan. Where do you fall on Fallout? I Fallout, um, Fallout. my first Fallout was Fallout Three, mm. um, which I know a lot of Keep a lot of old school Fallout fans be like, oh no. But I will say that as it, even it, because it was my first exposure to the series, mm-hmm. um, it still came across as super awesome because it did a lot of stuff that other games at the time weren't doing. Um, and even if it didn't do certain things quite as well as the old ones did, um, it still did a lot of things that I'd just never seen before. Well, there's a lot of cool thematic things that they borrow and, and you know, the, the way the story is put together, that kind of thing, mm-hmm. from um, the first two games. Mm-hmm. I do think that Fallout 3 had a lot of problems in terms of being way too black and white from a, from a morality standard, which doesn't really sure. fit with this post-apocalyptic world. Mm-hmm. They tried to basically make it too much of Elder Scrolls with guns. Yeah. And that was a lot of people's complaints. Mine, too. I still played through it and enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. Um, I also didn't like the story, the main story. Mm-hmm. There's some cool side quests. Mm-hmm. And definitely some cool DLC. Mm-hmm. I, I like the main story well enough to have it be the carrot on the stick, but did, but it wasn't, like, super motivating. You know? Okay. And, and the uh, ending was kind of meh. Yeah, the ending was, the, like, you have to sacrifice yourself or not. Mm-hmm. And, of course, I'm like, no, I'm not going to sacrifice myself. So <laughs> um, your thoughts on Three Dog? Because I wanted to shoot him in the face. In fact, I did, but he's, he's <laughs> invincible. Oh, is he? Yes. What are your thoughts on Three Dog? I, I thought he was extremely annoying. I didn't mind Three Dog. That was cool with Three Dog. I, I will say that was the other thing that I didn't like about Fallout 3. The earlier Fallout games, you could basically kill anyone, mm-hmm. um, which could sometimes be a bad thing for your game. Mm-hmm. But you pretty much had that choice. It was your choice. It was your call to make. Yeah. Um, Fallout 3, they, they have a lot of characters you just can't kill. It's mm-hmm. very, it was very frustrating. I mean, they intentionally made children mm-hmm. annoying in Little Lamplight. Mm-hmm. I'm sure anyone that plays knows what I'm talking about. Yeah. Little Lamplight. They, they literally have children um, that will threaten you. You're walking around with literally like, like, a, like a mini nuke bazooka on your back. And they'll start threatening you. And they, all have, like, they just have like a pointy stick. Mm-hmm. And you're just thinking, okay, at least let me slap the kid. At least. This is a post-apocalyptic world. Yeah. This would happen. Mm-hmm. But instead, no. They're just, you, can't, you can't hurt them. They're invincible. This is a problem with Elder Scrolls games, honestly. They do, they do the same thing in Skyrim. If you're mm-hmm. going to have kids in your game and you're going to make them invincible, and I'm not saying we should go around killing kids or anything. It's a video game, yeah. but... I'm not. I'm necessarily saying that we need to go around and have you know 3D ultra realistic child murder. <laughs> but if you're going to have kids in your game, and you're also going to go, well, we can't let them die from anything, the player or anything else. You know, kids dancing in the streets when like dragons are raiding your home happens inside. Yeah, yeah, Skyrim as well. But that's so you can't. You, you're like, well, we don't want to have them be be killed. Okay, fine. At least don't make them obnoxious. Mm-hmm. It's like they're just taunting the player. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I do think that they I, you don't have to shoot them, but maybe a slap, like 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 a kid slap button, like the kids like like you know comes up to you, bows up, and you just kind of go, no, you're a kid, slap him in the face, or, or at the very on. least, just like because even if you don't want to do that, because it's like oh, it's still violence against children, oh um, jeez, uh, well, but you don't want to do but, that. But that's like, my game, you see, yeah. that's that's the point of true, these games. It's true. supposed to be you're supposed to be an RPG, and I'm role playing as this guy who is, I mean, pretty much everyone who followed is playing as a guy as a as a guy or a girl, obviously, mm-hmm. who is really a hardened survivalist you have to be in this game and a hardened survivalist regardless of who you are if you're in a situation where someone is threatening to kill you mm-hmm. it doesn't matter if they're a kid or an adult you're not, not necessarily saying you're going to just kill everyone you come across but if they do that you have to knock them down a peg and make them realize that you are not one to be trifled with otherwise they might actually kill you in your sleep or something you have to do something you can't just be oh well i'll just like let them do whatever they want to me mm-hmm. you die people like that die in a post-apocalyptic world yeah yeah. Regardless, now that we've now that we've had our, our controversial subject, <laughs> no. Um, but but I will say, speaking of Fallout Four, and and the Fallout series in general, I did really enjoy New Vegas because I felt they brought back the, um, the, the, the morally sort of, gray. Yes, I, I really liked the focus on the tribal system. Like, I, I, I like groups. I, I like the faction system. Yeah. It, that. The fact was, that gaining reputation with one would lower your reputation yes. with another. And it, so it was less. It was you, know, you still had a general morality system. True, um, it was a lot more situational, which mm-hmm. I liked. Excuse me, but also you had that you you could only you could be good with one person, but bad be considered bad with others. I really thought that worked out very well, made it a lot more realistic. Brought back some of the developers from Fallout Two, which is why it was like that, by the way, mm. like uh, Chris Avalon. Um, so speaking of Fallout Four, which is coming out, I'm definitely apprehensive. I got to be honest. Mm. I, I like the series. I, I'm pro- I'm going to play it almost certainly. Mm. Um, I want to play it. I want it to be good, but I'm worried that it's going to go back to. Skyrim with guns, and, it's, and, it's, and even though I had some fun with Skyrim and I had some fun with Fallout Three, it it ultimately at a certain point becomes a very bland and repetitive experience because 
I really do think Bethesda is one of those developers that the games they put out in terms of like narratively and mm-hmm. also thematically, they become very bland. And the main thing they, that made Fallout yeah, they, exciting was basically taking the stuff that they property they had bought mm-hmm. that had already been made for Fallout One and Two and just sticking it in there. And that was the cool cool stuff. But none of the stuff that they did that was new was actually any good. Yeah, I think it's kind of like the Skyrim thing, where I know that there are just a ton of people who have poured thousands and thousands of hours into Skyrim, like literally thousands. Yeah. Um, but the thing about that to me is that it's. It's a sandbox game. It's yes. a game that you can just keep playing forever because there's enough content that you can that you can keep playing it forever. And that's kind of what it sounds like they're going with, with Fallout Four, from what little I've heard. And mm-hmm. I haven't I haven't been really following Fallout Four news. Um, I've seen like a couple of little trailers, but you know, not much. Um, but just the way people are talking about it, it's like, oh man, there's like all this content. It's like that doesn't sound like you know story to me. <laughs> it sounds like right. there's all this stuff you can do, which is cool. It's a game, and that's and people play games to do things. But for those of us who are looking for something a little bit deeper, a little bit more role play heavy, and mm-hmm. a little bit less just I can Chris, go and kill things heavy. What, what, <laughs> why are you expecting role play heavy content in a role playing game? It's, I don't. You're asking you know, for way too much. Yeah. You're asking for way too much. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so let's make some speculation here. Mm. Um, let's not. I'm not even going to ask what we think game sites are going to rate it because obviously they're all paid off. Ten out of ten. They're going to give it a, like a ten out of ten. They you gotta go a ten out of ten. Yeah, every every triple A uh, game gets ten out of ten now because or just about nine out of ten because they all get paid off and they're all just trying to get clicks, whatever. Um, but in terms of what we think, like our personal ratings, do we think this is going to be a game that we're going to just fall in love with and just play constantly, like I sort of did with? Um, Metal Gear, and I was I was pretty in love with Witcher Three for a while. Like, I kind of have to get back into it. Part mm-hmm. of my part of the thing was Metal Gear was coming out, and so that kind of caused me to put it down for a bit. Gotcha. But, um, but what are your thoughts on? How do you think you're going to feel about? I, I expect at least a seven out of ten. Um, no, no, no rating system. We don't do no, that here. We don't do that. We don't do that. Here. So what I'm what I'm I am going to play it at some point. I'm not planning currently to rush out and get it now as it gets closer to release date i might sort of find that oh look i've got 60 dollars in my bank account i'll go in and grab it um it's not a priority purchase for you, right it, 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 like especially right now like i don't care to go pre-order or anything like that and we still have a lot of missions left in metal gear exactly so. yeah metal gear is going to keep me busy for a while i probably won't finish it by then i might but i mm-hmm. probably won't finish it by november mm-hmm. 10th yeah i'll we'll have to see 11. um but i don't know i mean again i haven't really been following much i kind of expect it to be um, something that I'll enjoy playing through and then kind of be done with, you know? And that's kind of the way it is for me with all, well, most games in general, but, you know, Bethesda is a good example of really? Fallout 3, New Vegas. So, I, I pretty much get close to the end or clear it and then maybe start a second playthrough, but never, like, get anywhere near close to finishing a second playthrough. So you think you'll finish it? Probably. Okay. I, I, at least the main story. Like, I always finish okay. the main story. Because I, I gotta tell you, I put a lot of hours into Skyrim, and a lot of that was for mods and stuff too. But I never finished Skyrim. Yeah, and I heard I hear a lot of people do that. And for yeah. me, I mean, like, I finished Fall Three. I, I, I think Skyrim. I think it's the way I kind of play because again, you know, trying to role play in a role playing game. Mm-hmm. Um, I figure my character's top priority is whatever the main story is, and so I make that my top priority in play, which is why I always end up finishing the story, the main story, pretty quickly. I think I would probably do that if their Bethesda stories were. That are written, mm. you know, it's almost <laughs> they're something... big on lore. They're, they're, mm. They do really love their lore, mm. but the actual story is just. I, I almost Always wonder if something that would make it better for me is if there was no pretense of having the main story. If it was very simply, um, you are let loose into the world, and you basically say, "Okay, here's your sandbox. Go play." And you decide what you want to do. And there's all sorts of like every main quest, quote unquote, is a side quest chain. Doesn't I know there's a little bit of a thematic focus in in this game, but do you think Monster Hunter sort of does something like that? I've not played Monster Hunter. I ha- honestly, I haven't played it much. I I actually haven't played any of Monster Hunter to be honest. But it's a very popular game in certain circles, and from what I understand, it's, it's very much, much just straight up go grind and kill monsters. Yeah, not so much a grind. Way. It's more like you're just trying to hunt monsters. Mm-hmm. So it's it's almost like. Almost like a Pokemon thing mm-hmm. where you're trying to like. It kind of strikes me as like all. <laughs> some, something between like Pokemon and World of Warcraft. Kind of, yeah. Because there, there is sort of an online element to it as well. Mm-hmm. Believe it or not, we're not always playing games. Every now and then, we like to talk about the other stuff. We have Halloween coming up, and I don't know if you've been thinking about your costume, but I will tell you. I have that. not been thinking about my costume. I th- will tell you that I have been <laughs> thinking about my costume, uh, mainly because at work apparently it's like a big thing for Halloween. Huh. Um, so it's apparently a very huge holiday here. So it- I don't have the social pressures of work currently. <laughs> so um, like I, I don't think I've actually like celebrated Halloween for years just because I've always been either. in school and haven't cared. Yeah. So 
I, I, I felt that way, but I figured this year I might go all out. Mm. And what I'm looking at picking up is um, I'm going to try to go as Venom Snake. Very nice. Uh, I'm, I'm even going to go all out. I'm going to get the bionic arm, mm. eye patch. I'm going to go full hog. <laughs> I think it'll be really fun. If, if I can put this costume together, I'll see. It's a cost. It's a little prohibitive, but I think I'm going to go for it. Mm. Um, just because I think it would be pretty fun, and mm. I can get some mileage out of it over this uh, Halloween. Very cool. Um, and you can keep it for conventions and stuff like that. Yes. If you need to. But what I propose is that is that because we are a gaming podcast, and because we're we've been talking about having a Halloween special, which I think is a great idea. I think during our Halloween special, we should come in costume. Whoever we invite to the Halloween co- Halloween special must come in costume. <laughs> As a video game related, we'll be very loose with related to video games. Uh-huh. So if someone wants really wants to do Star Wars, uh, so boring. You can do that because technically Star Wars has been a video game too. Uh, Battlefront's coming out. Uh, boring, so. <laughs> but but you can do that if you really want to. But um, require people to come in costume, and then we can take some pictures and post them up on the site. In the uh, we have we have a section that we don't really use that much, a blog related section mm-hmm. uh, that we can possibly I think it's called insights. Yeah, we can go ahead and put some pictures up in there, and then talk about our costumes. It'll be fun doing the podcast in costume. Could be fun. Maybe even in character. Uh, I don't know if we can pull that off. Uh, you do a much better snake voice than I do. Although I'd be, I have to somehow do key for snake. So, yeah. um, so uh, what would you come as? Do you have any ideas? Oh, I have no idea. Um, I'm trying to think of things that I could kind of just like pull off fairly easily. Mm-hmm. You, um, you could come as Ness. You could literally just get like a striped shirt, yeah. <laughs> wear some shorts, and just carry with you like you know like a baseball bat and mm-hmm. get like a baseball cap. Maybe there's like a lot of cheap game costumes mm-hmm. that you can think of if you can yeah. create it. I don't know. I don't really like. I want to sort of. I almost think of it more as, like, casting myself for a theater thing, uh-huh. more so than just, like, picking any game character. Okay. So, like, who could I kind of be cast as? Mm-hmm. Um, like, given my age and build and all that sort of stuff. So, like, maybe Mario. Um, I'd have to... Maybe... Yeah. I, I don't know if I... I might just go it's, with full it's beard. It's you, Mario. It's me, Mario. Like, I'd probably... Mario. I'd probably just go with, like, the full beard uh-huh. iteration of Mario and not just the mustachioed iteration of Mario. Is, is there a full beard? <laughs> I don't think there is a full beard. I'm, uh, I'm making one. You're, you're making one. You don't want to shave the beard. <laughs> it's, Mario. it's, uh... It's a Brooklyn Mario, you know. It's uh, we're just we're, we're actual plumbers, literally. You know, it's I, I can't do that accent. <laughs> have you seen the Super Mario Brothers Super Show from the eighties? I have actually. Yeah, you, you're gonna go as like the Lou Albano. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, by the way, I, I will recommend that show because the the live action segments are so ridiculously cheesy that it's actually a fun show to watch. Yeah, yeah. I've uh, I've, I've it on DVD somewhere around here. It's on Netflix too, actually. Oh yeah, that's so, really awesome. Um, yeah, I haven't watched it in years, but um, I did recently try watching it with my niece because mm-hmm. we were just like, here, what's something on Netflix that I won't hate um, as I'm you know keeping an eye on her? And so it's like, oh, Mario. That was uh, I remember that being kind of cool when I was little. And it's like, uh, I'm not really that... I don't like it that much. <laughs> what? So. Uh, you don't like cheesy stuff? Uh, I don't Too know. cheesy? It just, it, it didn't really appeal. I loved it. I gotta tell you, I, I've watched <laughs> it. I've gone back and watched it again. But I like cheesy shows, I'll admit. I like cheesy shows. Yeah, yeah. We can maybe do a segment where we talk about cheesy shows. Mm-hmm. We'll talk about Power Rangers and stuff. I'll, I'll have to do a little <laughs> bit of research and see what sort of characters I might be able to pull off okay. for, uh, for the Halloween thing. That is fair. This is the Gaming Meta. News and commentary about the games industry and gamer culture. We have some topics that we'd like to discuss. And uh, the first one up to the plate, uh, there's been some news that came out today, actually, about the newest uh, Tomb Raider. It's called, is it called Rise of the Tomb Raider or Tomb Raider Rises? Or I think it's the Rise of the Tomb Raider or something like that. The Dark Tomb Raider Night Rises. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The, the, the Dark Tomb Rises in the rating and something. She wears a lot less clothing than uh, Batman does, I will say. So. I, I guess relatively speaking, although yeah, relatively the speak. uh, seeing the screenshots though looks like um, almost like sort of like the archaeologist khaki sort of look, mm-hmm. um, which is interesting to me. But anyway, and car- does she wear cargo shorts in the new artwork? I, from what I, I mean, I, again, I have, I've only glanced at business it, but, casual because it was like one of those like Twitter's added this thing <laughs> recently where it auto plays videos, and so you see like promoted videos from right. places including Tomb Raider, for example. And so, like, I just sort of saw, like, flashes of a trailer that was, like, there was no sound because I was just flicking through my Twitter. Do, do you but, click on um, that it offends you when you don't like those things and want them to go away? Because I do. <laughs> There's so many things on Twitter that, and honestly, it's not that I'm actually offended. It's yeah. just I know they'll, they'll stop doing it. Yeah. It takes a lot to offend me, but seeing that stuff, it's just annoying. Mm-hmm. So I just like to go, okay, that offends me, and then mm-hmm. they just will stop what, What's funny is I can tell instantly what's a promoted tweet, because I know who I follow, yeah. who's actually active, so it's like, oh yeah, I don't follow that person, That's they paid for that, mm-hmm. you know? And I'm not going to give them the dignity of actually clicking on it. Yeah. Um, 
Or give them the satisfaction, I should say. We're such rebels. Yeah. Rebels. Rebels uh, with a cause. What, what I do find I do, and this so uh, without going clause. without going too far off track, Facebook also does that thing with like the top trending stories and like mm-hmm. the right sidebar. Um, and I I like try Xing a lot of those out and they say like why don't you want to see this? It's like I don't care about this and I don't care about this, I don't care about this. and like for a little while my taste like my parent taste according to Facebook is really weird because I was getting a lot of like celebrity gossip. I think it was because I was ignoring most stuff that wasn't entertainment. Mm-hmm. Um and then I think now it's sort of wising up to the fact that I don't care about the Kardashians. <laughs> and so it's it's not showing oh, me. Oh god, like, don't get me started on the it's Kardashians. It's like so and so posts a picture of themselves wearing a thing. It's like Wow, that's trending. I care not. <laughs> but, Do we want to have a Kardashian minute? No, no, no. We don't want to talk any bit about the. Have you been seeing the new South Park episodes? No, I've not. Because um, the new season is actually really good. It's a real mm. return to form, and they've been skewering uh, the whole like the whole thing is is they've got like the uh, um, PC principal, mm. and uh, like they have like a bit, kind of like a frat frat boy. It's not really a cult. It's just like a frat boy group of like like the PC bros mm. that, that uh, Randy, uh, Stan's dad, has joined. <laughs> uh, so he's pretty hilarious. But um, essentially, they do have this part where they're talking about the whole Caitlyn Jenner thing. Mm. And, um, it's Kyle's whole position on which is one I agree with, is just because now like uh, Bruce Jenner decided to go through you know the change mm. and the transgender issue and all that, doesn't suddenly make him heroic. He's someone that has been like as kind of been a kind of a bad person if you have been following any of the Kardashian news. Mm. He was indicted in the whole um, wrongful death where he ran over that one woman. Oh, yeah, that whole Yeah, which he got out of because he's a celebrity, obviously. Mm. But um, that whole issue is kind of, was one of those, like, hot issues where now you have to act as though he's a hero just yeah. because, or she's a hero, whatever yeah, it's, you want it's, 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 it's just nonsense. Like, yeah. it's, as a person, you can, you, can, you can respect or not respect the transgender issue, but mm. you have to look at, from this individual person, mm. in my opinion... It's kind of, is is not a good person. It's kind mm. of a bad person just because this person has now now become like a symbol for mm. you know uh, uh, trans, transgender rights mm. doesn't mean that suddenly have to like that person. Mm-hmm. So and, and that and was kind and of and it's also the, it's also not a holistic show. thing either. Where it's like you can respect them in this regard without appreciating them for everything else they've done. You know? Well, I don't so. think necessi- I don't think a, a, a person that is a celebrity mm. that goes through that goes through this and then gets even more celebrity status from it it deserves respect. They're getting more attention and being treated, put on a pedestal. Like, what, where's the respect issue there? It's not you're not risking anything. Now, if you're like a random person mm-hmm. and you go through this and you can say yes, you're risking a whole bunch of, of like social you mm-hmm. know ostracism and all that. Sure, but if you're a, a giant public figure, this huge celebrity that now everyone's treating this like some hero because of doing this, where's where's the heroism there? You're not you're not facing any sort of like you're supposed to. Supposedly, he's mm. like, oh, he's facing all of this discrimination. Not really, actually. If, mm. you, if you're my, my impression is people have been very supportive. Exactly, it's the exact opposite yeah. of what but they presented as though. Oh, people, people are hated. No, the only people that are actually talking against it are people that are kind of saying what I'm saying. Where I didn't like him before. Mm. I don't. I don't. I didn't like him as Bruce. I don't like her as Caitlyn. I don't mm. like either one. They're the same person. Just because. Yeah. I'm, I'm fairly because indifferent. He, yeah. You know, it's just kind of like I'm, I, I've not been followed. I'm, I'm really anti Kardashian, and mm. I'm anti that whole group, and the yeah. whole like, and just because you know, so. That whole thing, like I'm against all of them, kind mm-hmm. of. Anything on entertainment tonight, usually I don't care about. <laughs> Pretty so, much, yeah. But that, I mean, that's my whole thoughts on it. No, it's the same thing with. Um, don't, don't even get me started on like the editing style yeah. of entertainment tonight. Yeah. Uh, that is just an, that's an, let's stick mm-hmm. a pen in that one because yeah, that's an entirely different. But anyway, the no, no, I think it, it kind of goes back to the the some people are very reactionist where if you talk against someone that they like just a person, they take it as oh you're talking against what that person quote represents. Mm-hmm. Which is, of course, nonsense. Mm-hmm. So, me saying I don't like Caitlyn Jenner doesn't mean I have anything against you know transgender mm-hmm. people. I just have a problem with Caitlyn Jenner. Mm-hmm. Just like how if you say something against a, this is something that actually kind of annoys me. Some people like to cry misogyny if you mm-hmm. say I don't like this woman. I, mm-hmm. don't, I don't respect her. I think she's horrible. Mm-hmm. You're not saying that about all women. You're yeah. saying about this one particular woman that yeah. you don't like. So, it's people like- have to kind of step back and mm-hmm. realize you can dislike someone for them being themselves. In yeah. fact, most people, if they don't like you, it's probably because mm. of something you did. You're probably kind of a jerk. Mm. It's like, I don't like Westboro Baptist Church. <gasps> you don't like Christians? It's like, no, I just don't like that church. Precisely. <laughs> that's actually a pretty good example. Yeah. And, and and one that I think people recognize. But yeah. then they sort of lose sight of it when you point at a particular person and then you're like, well, you must not like that person because you don't like what they stand for. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's absurd. Uh, but anyway, getting back to the new Tomb Raider talk. And leave yes. all that in. I think it's good. Good discussion. <laughs> I, li- I like that we're kind of being more free-flowing. Sure. Back and forth. But um, 
So the new Tomb Raider, uh, the, it is currently offering 300 game-altering microtransactions. Is the key game-altering. Mm. So um, define game-altering. Well, it's apparently going to be a lot of things like um, extra content of things that you might find in the game, like uh, weapons, armor, that kind of stuff. Also a lot of little Easter eggs, um, extra content like uh, different modes of play. Excuse me. Um, all of the kind of stuff that back in, say, you know, 10 years ago in games you'd find naturally through play. Mm -hmm. Through play, you would find additional equipment. You'd have to go out and fight. Like, you say, for example, uh, Final Fantasy mm -hmm. VII, or, or I think eight, nine, they all did, kind of did the same thing, where you would have, like, um, optional bosses and optional, you know, areas and side quests and that sure. kind of thing. Yeah. Um, those are the sort of things that nowadays, and some of these companies would, and, and, and I actually kind of bring that up because Tomb Raider is being developed by Square Enix, mm -hmm. so it's another Square Enix property, but, um, or at least it is because they bought the rights to it. It does um, kind of remind me, sorry to, not to bring us too off, far yeah. off track, but last Square Enix game I kind of played at any length, and even then I haven't really gotten very far in it, but um, Final Fantasy XIII 2, I'm reminded yeah. of how they had a bunch of DLC for like the sort of like side mode yes. where you can do these optional boss fights. I never liked, but that's, I, I didn't realize that, but that's actually, I never, I, I, I can't play Final Fantasy anymore, it's been bad yeah. for too long. But, um, that doesn't surprise me because mm -hmm. that's what they're. That's what the the game industry. Unfortunately, a lot of the AAA devs are moving mm -hmm. in that direction. So something I'd like to clarify actually about the Tomb Raider thing: Have they said yet? Like I assume that when they say there's 300 little microtransactions mm -hmm. you can make, it's it's not like um, each time you find a thing, pay us 99 cents to get it. I assume it's more like yeah, there's like an, a special in game currency that is like okay, you found a thing, pay this many special coins to get it, and you buy like. 500 special coins for 10 bucks or something like that. Is that more what it is? I believe so. Okay. But I think it's kind of a mix of a whole bunch of different mm. things because there's also game modes, like mm -hmm. different modes of play that you can play. That, that I can head modes, yeah. like that. It's just, it's the sort of thing that's annoying because it used to be, this was sort of like the fun stuff that developers would like slip into games mm. or some, sometimes it would be planned, but other times it would be like programmers would slip in little extra fun, East, mm. Easter eggs is what they would call them. Mm. And now apparently a lot or, of this, Or game modes, for instance, is something yes. that like you would need to have X number of game modes to be competitive. Yeah, people didn't want just a straight up single player campaign. You had to have some yes. sort of multiplayer mode. And and now we're moving towards. And I understand the games are expensive, but we're moving towards this. And which actually this kind of falls into our mini topic as well about the expensive games and mm. why that might be, mm. um, and why it doesn't necessarily have to be. But um, that is something that AAA developers are really into is trying to wring as much money out as they possibly can. And I think it is detrimental to the to the actual core experience of the game. Because if you don't if you incorporate all of this stuff into the game, I mean, imagine if you look at look at a game that is like extremely loot heavy, focused on loot, Diablo. Mm. Look at what happened with Diablo three. One of the things that really hurt that game, I really do believe, and yes, it's still split a lot mainly because of the Diablo name. But apparently, they've improved too. They, they've yeah, done some to things an, to an extent. Of, yeah. But it's like, as as a longtime Diablo fan, it, it was a disappointment to me and and to a couple of my friends and a lot of Diablo fans, and, and, and mainly because Diablo's biggest thing that it, that it did was loot acquisition the way that it did loot and unfortunately Blizzard was so focused on making money off of the real the real money auction that they intentionally designed the games that the levels you couldn't actually beat a level on the highest difficulty which is the whole point is to play through the multiple difficulties mm -hmm. you couldn't beat it at that difficulty unless you got loot from the next act mm -hmm. which you couldn't get to because you couldn't get through that one act because uh, you didn't have the loot for it. Huh? The only way you could do it was you had to grind for stuff and then sell it on the auction house and eventually get more money or pay real life money. Mm -hmm. Then you could actually get the stuff and be and be competitive, mm -hmm. or sell a bunch of stuff so that you can then have money to buy the stuff. So and yes, since that, you have that actually, requires yeah. hours and hours and hours and yeah. hours of grind. So it's mm -hmm. like they're they're and they're doing it on purpose. Whereas before, the whole design of the of the loot was actually set up very brilliantly to. Kind of you give you always, fresh new material. Yes, and you'd frequently. always be set up for the next act, and it was all in like yes, there's like rare items, but the way they dropped and the way it was set up was much more intuitive, and uh -huh. it, it felt rewarding and, instead of punishing. Even though there were some very difficult areas, so it used to be like that was the biggest, the biggest positive of the game turned into the biggest negative in Diablo Three. So it was like a huge step back from two, mm -hmm. um, and that but that's the direction that a lot of AAA game developers are going, maybe because they feel like. This is a way they can make more money, or they feel threatened by the mobile market. Mm. Um, what are your thoughts on that? You, you can tell I'm against it. <laughs> yeah, microtransitions <laughs> in general. Yeah, I mean, I kind of I, I fall into the camp that says um, that DLC and microtransactions. Like, I don't like microtransactions in general, but sometimes they're done better than others. Um, I don't mind DLC, but I like it when DLC is done right. Yeah. I think there are developers who do, do DLC yeah. right oh, I do. when it is like. 
you have a complete game, and then you just keep giving us expansions, basically. Yes. Like, Border- Borderlands is a great example yes. of a series that does DLC really mm-hmm. well. Because it's it's stuff, and like they even take the DLC's excuses to do stuff that's thematically very different from the main series, or to sort of like mess around in ways that they went with the main game. Because they want the main game to be a very particular type of experience. Mm-hmm. But then, like for example, I think one of my favorite DLC things ever was um, the Assault on Dragon's Keep. Um, in Borderlands 2, which is basically the you're playing a D and D campaign effectively. Uh, it's called Bunkers and Badasses, so it's it's B and B. But you're basically playing D and D. Yeah, Breakfast. Right. 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 Did I say Blackfist? <laughs> Blackfist. <laughs> um, but you're playing D and D in Borderlands, which it was. It, the the story was hilarious. You get like all this different gameplay. They added like whole new mechanics to the game um, yeah. for this DLC. I was gonna say um, it. it was like a really awesome thing, and it was just something that was. Like, you pay a reasonable sum to basically have this much content added to the game for after you finish playing. Yeah, it's it, like you said, expansion was the word that you said, and I yeah. think that's something that... It, you, that's what we used to have in games. They would have a complete game experience, and they would have an expansion that came out afterward mm-hmm. with new content. And there's definitely some that still goes on today. Another example of that... Um, I don't know if you played a lot of the DLC for uh, Fallout New Vegas. Mm-hmm. Had I did some, not, it actually. had some really cool DLC to it that I thought was, was actually really, really awesome that actually also did some cool experimental stuff. I know there was one, and I'm sorry I'm blanking on the name, but it was like you're in this, um, excuse me, you sort of, you, you, you uh, there's ones where, for example, you lose all of your loot. I think it's actually ex- expansion or DLC for Fallout 3. I like the DLC for Fallout 3 more than actual Fallout 3. Mm. Uh, but it was the pit DLC where you lose all your stuff, and now you're in, like, the Pittsburgh area, and it's, like, sort of this <laughs> weird... Um, or like mining slash like underground fighting thing and you have you spend a lot of the game with using what was it like your fist and some new weapon I, I'm mm. trying to remember what it was specifically but it was pretty cool uh, like a melee weapon mm. uh, there was also DLC for Fallout 3 where like you are abducted by aliens and you have to break out and you get like an alien blaster and the whole thing is like takes place on an alien spaceship mm. I think I heard about that one there's yeah. an element of stealth initially um, to it in mm. order to survive before you get all, get more equipment in um, Fallout New Vegas, you had this pretty cool DLC where you were um, invited to solve. It was like something like it's almost like a, it, was, it was presented as like a noir, almost mm-hmm. like a detective noir story kind of mm-hmm. thing, but with like these weird zombie creatures that were really hard to kill, and and these different people, and you weren't sure what their deal was, but they all had their own kind of like mini stories, and they sort of experimented with both new gameplay types and new new uh, um, narratives and mm-hmm. the way that they told the story. So, like you said, it was. It felt like an expansion. It felt like a complete experience mm-hmm. that was using the game's levels and coding and all that stuff as a basis mm-hmm. to make something new. Which just sounds like what you're talking about with yeah. Borderlands. Uh, even though I'm not really, I'm not really big into Borderlands, but I respect that mm-hmm. sort of development style. Whereas having like 300 game altering microtransactions to me is nonsense. Mm-hmm. You know, that's something that I don't want to see. I will say too the the other the other type of DLC that for me is kind of borderline, but mm-hmm. I can I can understand it, especially depending on the genre. Um, for example, a lot of racing games have done this that I've seen where um, a certain while like sometimes they do it out of release, sometimes it takes them a while to do it. Um, but there will occasionally be DLC for games that is um, unlock all the things. Um, where I, I get that for people who, for instance, are they're busy uh, and they don't have time to play like. 30, 40 hours of a game to unlock everything, but mm-hmm. they still want to have, like, access to, for, for example, the best cars and stuff like that. So they can pay, like, you know, however many dollars. I think it was, like, $5 usually to, like, unlock all vehicles in the game. Um, so things like that, kind of, like, time savers. Mm-hmm. Um, it's something where I think that that's totally cool for people who want, basically, to save the time. If they, if they find that that $5 is worth that time saved then kind of more power to them. It's something that I would never pay money for because I just, like, you know, I'll, I'll play the game. I don't mm-hmm. need to spend money on that. But I can definitely see how it's, it's like, a helpful perk for some people. I think that's... While I think, in theory, that could work, mm-hmm. my problem with that style is that it's really easy for developers to realize, like, like Blizzard did, mm-hmm. oh, well, why don't we just make everything so difficult and so ridiculously time-consuming to get that you pretty much have to use room money. Good point, it. yeah. And so and, that's, and that's, that's a trap. Make, that, yeah. that one can also make the argument, too, that you could do the same thing with cheat codes. If what, all you're interested in is just giving people a convenient way to unlock stuff, right. to say, enter this code and everything's unlocked. Which is what they used to do back, back yeah. in the day. Yeah. Um, okay, so moving along, um, another gaming meta topic. Mm-hmm. Uh, I read a little bit about the video game voice actors strike. Yep. And I know you know more about this than me, so I'll let you go ahead and 
Tell us a little bit about this. So the union is called SAG-AFTRA. It's a uh, merging of the Screen Actors Guild and the American Federation of Television and Radio Artists uh, to form a that super, is, that is the super union. <laughs> uh, so SAG-AFTRA. That sounds um, like the most boring superhero ever. The <laughs> super union. Yeah. <laughs> the super union. He represents uh, the rights of the, of the, the, the workers. The American worker. <laughs> uh, we call him a labor man. Uh... Yeah, so the, the story has been kind of hitting the round, or making its rounds in video game circles, especially because um, it's voice actors who are concerned currently with working conditions um, in video games in particular. The, the um, fine working conditions. Are, so, are, they, are they like in mines? Like, like you know, they're... Are they working inside factories where they're little no, children they're over in like Asia and um, the little hands can get cut up in like machinery or no? Uh, one, one person that comes up on the podcast quite a bit, uh, Will Wheaton, um, I, I found one of his articles because one of the voice actors I follow on Twitter um, basically said that the article that Will wrote really explained it well. Um, I'll actually, I'll give you the name of it if you want to look it up yourself because I'm not going to read the whole thing to you right now. Yeah, I know, I follow, I mean, I, I, I've seen some like... Um, like Troy Baker, mm-hmm. or I think Phil Lamar, I think was one that I saw mm-hmm. who had. I know he's done. He's done a lot of voice work in cartoons and games yeah. as well. Um, basically, cool. he was actually on Mad TV. If you remember that that TV show from mm-hmm. way back in the day, as a comedian. I did not see that actually, but you, I, I think you'd recognize his voice. I probably would. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's on willwheaton.net, and the article is called This is Why I Support a SAG After Strike Authorization for Video Games, and it isn't about money. Because the initial thought anytime someone's proposing a strike is right. like, oh, they're just complaining they're not getting paid enough. Um, and and what, one do, of their, do you believe him when he says it's not about money? I, because I don't. I, I do believe, and I'm not saying I disagree yeah, with the strike, he, but he, I think that's a little disingenuous to say it's not he, about money. He acknowledges that it is partially about money, but it's not just about the money. It's about Getting what they deserve, right? It, it's, AKA money. It's about the ability to negotiate a little bit easier. Um, negotiate for what? So, what, what are they trying to negotiate for? I'm just curious. Uh, again, I'm not reading the entire article right now. Right. But, but are they, are one, they t- one of the main issues, for example, is, is the negotiation related to money? Yes and no. Okay. So, for <laughs> example, currently there's the thing where um, apparently, like video game companies. Uh, or something like that, are able to fine um, agents, or the, rather the union, I think it's maybe allowed to, like, fire... They're allowed to go through the union mm-hmm. to fine agents, like, a lot of money if mm-hmm. actors don't go to audition for something. Right. So, um, we're back to money. In a way, yeah. I'm, I'm, but, I'm, I'm being a jerk so, because so, I want to I make a point. I want to make a very big point what, here. What if, and, and my point is... It ultimately, it everything is, does come down to money. It is about... Because <laughs> they say working conditions, mm-hmm. but let's let's be honest here. They're, these are... These are voice actors. We're not talking about minors. We're not talking about people that are, like, working with heavy machinery. He he addresses this argument very directly in the article, actually, because he says, like, we acknowledge that we're not digging ditches. But, for example, one of the things they want I'm not saying they shouldn't get more money. I'm just saying that they should be honest. It is about money. It is about money. They are saying it's about money, but it's also about, for example, um, limiting, uh, like, what's the term they use, like... Vocally straining sessions to no more than two hours, like something where you're having to like yell at the top of your lungs, and like really screw up your throat and stuff like that. Um, because it's something that's very important to voice actors for the career is vocal health. Mm-hmm. And so if you're like, they'll do like, you know, six to eight hour recording sessions sometimes if it's just standard dialogue. Um, but for instance, if you're like screaming constantly, especially if it's a video game, we have to do like death cries and pain and mm-hmm. all that sort of stuff. Um, it can be very taxing. And so they want, for example, to be able to have a thing where they're allowed to limit these sessions to two hours just so they don't like kill their voices. Um, th- again, I'd recommend checking out that article. Um, right. and you'll probably still find issues with it because, you know, um, while he does address the issue of like, it's not just about money. It's like, you know, you, you could argue that and I, I see the argument of ultimately it is about money. No, ultimately it is. And like, like you talk about the six hour session, I'm sure if it was like, Oh, two hours, but then you get overtime for those extra four mm-hmm. and you get paid like a bunch more, mm-hmm. they're suddenly not going to. And, and there, there are issues like, you know, residuals and stuff like that. And yes, people say like, funny. and why don't like, you know, the programmers who work on it get residuals. And I think yes. part of the reason for that is that, being a voice actor and being, say, a programmer are two very different things. Programming is a full-time job. Mm-hmm. You go in, you know, at gaming studios, it's not necessarily 9 to 5. It might be like 8 to 10 or something, but um, whatever the case might be. But you... Um, Programmers make the game happen. Yeah, they make the game happen. And voice actors, a lot of times, they get, like, two or three gigs a month if mm-hmm. they're lucky. And they, and they become the voice of the game, and they get all the attention, and the programmers get almost no attention. Mm. And so, I'm starting to side a little bit more against the voice actor. Read, read the article. <laughs> because, uh, I'll, I'll say I'll say this. I'll say this. Yeah. My because he's going to have a very tough time convincing me. I, mm-hmm. I will say this. I do. I do agree that sometimes voice actors really don't get uh, get paid enough for the work that they put into it. Mm-hmm. Um, 
That being said, I kind of disagree with this. Let's try to paint them as though they have these horrible working conditions. The whole like, oh, they're not saying it's horrible. the whole voice. They're, they're like, saying oh, they're, they're talking for a long time and like doing loud loud noises and that kind of thing and making big cries. To me, comes across as kind of an excuse. Mm. I mean, you you think about the sort of money, for example. I mean, the sort of money that some of these some of the voice actors, the bigger name voice mm. actors, can potentially make for doing something that requires no education and very little training. I'm talking about the ones that basically can just use their own voice, not the ones that actually do a voice. Because mm. I have more respect for ones that can do a voice. I, I would, a lot of voice actors that literally they just do their own voice. It, it's for me, it's like artists like, in well, general. We, where, does he ever do a voice? No. Occasionally. No, he doesn't. I've heard him do voices. Really? Yeah. Okay. I'm, uh, I'm calling you out on that one. I'm calling you out. All right, fine. So Jim, uh, call out. I, I would like to have the, an example. The, the, the of Jim, call it. Uh, well, I, mean, I haven't. I've, I've heard him do his voice, mm-hmm. but I haven't had him, heard him do voices. Like, for example, Mark Hamill has his voice, mm-hmm. and then he has multiple voices, like... Uh, obviously, the Joker, mm. or like uh, I mean, the Will, fire, the Force of the Fire King. Will, Will's not at like Mark Hamill levels. I'll give you that, but he like for example, if you've ever seen uh, Titans Grave, um, mm-hmm. he does voices in that because he GMs, and so he'll take on voices for different NPCs. Right. But are like those that. little voices like an actual voice actor level voices, or are they? You could do those voices because I've heard you do voices, mm-hmm. and you could do those voices. Uh, he doesn't better well, than why I does? <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, why? Why does he? Because you're pretty good, actually. I think you're, you're selling yourself short. Yeah. But why does he get those positions and you don't? Because he's a name. Yeah, and there's something and, to that. But someone like, for example, a Troy Baker or a Phil Lamar, who I mentioned mm-hmm. before, or Mark Hamill, mm-hmm. even though he did have a name mm-hmm. somewhat in acting, mm-hmm. really, he's more known as a voice actor now. Those people get their roles mm-hmm. because they're actually really yeah. good voice actors. And there, there are different tiers, too. Like, yeah. they're like the creme de la creme, and they're the people who get a lot of work but maybe aren't the greatest, and then there are people who... Elite. And then there are people who... Do, <laughs> <laughs> and then there are people who just do like right voiceover up. for commercials, right. you know that sort of thing. No, but but I think the the idea is that especially for the people who aren't in the advantageous positions of being able to have steady work and make a living off of voice mm-hmm. acting, um, they want like things to be negotiable and for conditions to be good for the people who are just trying to scrape a living with it. Uh, uh, it's kind of like in the the NFL Players mm-hmm. Association, for example, and any any player association. There's kind of this battle between the players and the league because. You know, you could argue it's like, oh, well, these people make millions and millions of dollars, but what about all the little guys who are just there, like on the practice squads or the third string or whatever, who are just scraping by? Well, not scraping, scraping by. by. Are you kidding? But, but making a lot less making per year, several and, hundred thousand dollars per year. But their their future is not guaranteed. But they're yes, but if they, 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 they if might they be actually, there for like three years and then be out. If you could get a few hundred thousand dollars a year just for three years of your life. Mm-hmm. How I would mean, that change your life? I would, I would take for the it. rest of your life. I, I'm, I'm not, just asking. I'm you. not saying I'd be hurting. But why do you think these people have such trouble when they get out? Because they're used to that income and they don't know how to live without it. Exactly. Yeah. That happens. And like NBA is a big example of this too, mm-hmm. where because I mean they, their salaries in NBA are huge. Or like yeah. baseball, mm-hmm. all these sports. I actually, I'm, I respect mm-hmm. athletes, but at the same time, a lot of them just freaking don't know how to mm-hmm. invest their money. Well, anyway, to get anyway, back, to, get back to, into, to into sort of to sort of put a wrap yeah. on this, and I, again, I would recommend reading the article, draw your own conclusions. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that Will makes some very interesting points, and I'm sure there are some interesting counterpoints as well. Um, I made some of them. Yes, exactly. Uh, but um, what they have done is when they say they have authorized a strike, they're not saying they are going on strike. What it is is it's saying that um, we, the members of the union, are authorizing the union to be able to do this so that they can use that as a bargaining card in negotiations. Mm-hmm. Um, so basically, it might not even come down to a strike. You can say, like, hey, we will go on strike if you don't do this, and then they can come to a compromise. Basically, what it's saying is that if it does come to a strike, we're allowing it, um, whereas before that wasn't the case. And so it's like, well, what are you going to do? Go on strike? You can't go on strike. You know, that sort of thing. So um, labor negotiations, fun. <laughs> yeah. I, but uh, it, it's, a, it's a complicated issue. Um, I, I think it's... It's one of those things where like no one is like evil, you know. It's just kind of a thing where I wouldn't call it evil. I don't think yeah. I don't think it's wrong mm-hmm. to want to be paid fairly mm-hmm. for your work. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying that there needs they should be a little bit more upfront about it. They're trying mm-hmm. to present themselves as victims mm-hmm. and all these 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 oh they're working conditions. And whatever. again, I, I mean, mean having, it, it is about they having, believe having, they want to be paid fairly for their work. Yeah, That's it. And there's there is that, but I also think that reading the article, I, it didn't come across to me as. Um, like, they, they definitely, like, all these points you made about, like, you know, it's like, oh, well, the work isn't like this, or it's not that. They do acknowledge all those points, and then they, they And then they it. gloss over them. Yeah. It's what it sounds like to me. Cause, make, cause, you re- read, read for yourself and make your own decision. Well, you're, I, well I, I thought it was... Unless, a, the, unless they have more than, like, oh, no, they were recording for, like, a few extra hours and my voice is strained. They well, got a little better than that. They, they go, they talk about at length what it entails, 
And it's something that from the outside looking in doesn't seem as bad as actually, like I, I can even say doing this voice for backward compatible is like, I'll do that for 10 minutes mm-hmm. and I'll, I'll feel sore. It's, it's not as easy as it seems. If you get paid the sort of money that some of the, these voice actors get paid for doing that voice, would you still do it? I would have no voice for the rest of the week. That's fine. And that's, that's they're their not, point. But they're not expecting you to. They're but but, they, but they have day jobs, and they need to have their voice at day jobs. So it, it's, it's more complicated than I don't know. I don't, I, know. These I don't people, know about leaving your voice. Mo- I don't need your voice. <laughs> Most voice actors don't subsist solely on voice acting. It's, it's the same with a lot of artists. Yeah. That's um, true, but the, then the question becomes, do most, the most voice actors have these really long sessions? And I would say probably, where they're like screaming and doing all that. Probably not, either. It seems like they're taking an anomalous event and then using that as their example. Yep. Draw your own conclusions. Right. <laughs> I will. We, we, will uh, we will leave the debate at that for now. <laughs> it's only fun if we debate about it. It's not fun if we just talk <laughs> and we say, oh yeah, it's so bad, just support this cause. No, let's, let's talk about it. See, Jim, uh, brings, bring, Jim brings the saltiness, <laughs> I bring the, like, oh, I see everyone's point. Yeah. That's kind of my thing, so. <laughs> no, I think, I think they do have a point. I'm not mm. saying they don't. I'm just saying... Let's cut the pity party. Let's get right down to brass tacks. That's what I'm saying. Mm. So go ahead and just say, hey, guys, look, we want more money. We feel we deserve it. Here's why. If you don't give it to us, we'll go on strike. There you go. Mm. That's your argument. And now, the official One Tweet RPG of the week. All right, so this week's uh, One Tweet RPG is uh, a panel of judges follows you. First time actions always succeed. After each use, roll 3d10. This is each judge's score. Uh, The average is the new obstacle for the action on a d10. So basically the idea here um, is that you're sort of like performing for this arbitrary, uh, you know, group that is like judging your performance. Like it's not really so much that you're rolling to see if you succeed. It's kind of assumed that you succeed, um, at least the first time. You say, uh, I'm going to attack this thing. Um, So you do the attack and this is the first time the judges are seeing it. And so they give you a score, you know, you roll three D10s and basically it's like one of them gave you a six, one of them gave you a three, one of them gave you a 10. Uh, So it's going to vary wildly because it's dice naturally. Mm -hmm. Um, but then you find the average, and then that becomes the obstacle. So essentially the idea being that however well you did it the first time, you have to do it better the next time, or else it's not going to succeed, because you're just going to be like, meh. And for some reason, if like their, their approval is what determines whether or not it's successful. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's kind of a goofy idea, uh, something that might be fun to mess around with. Um, but then the difficulty also changes. Like You kind of have to keep ramping up, and if you can't meet what you did last time, then you fail, and, but then your difficulty also goes down for the next time, where if you sort of do something more impressive than the last one, um, then it's easier for you to succeed at the action. Hmm, cool. So That's pretty neat. Okay, so uh, we're going to get into our media topic, and we're going to talk about performance in games. Indeed. And when I speak of performance, I'm specifically talking about bringing in actors to either... Uh, this encompasses voice acting, but it also encompasses um, motion capture. Mm-hmm. Uh, in other words, performance capture. Sometimes it's called performance capture. Um, any sort of like facial, facial performance capture, facial modeling, that kind of thing. Yeah. We're, we're basically you're trying to to mimic an actor on on the screen, mm-hmm. or you're trying to give um, a voice to a character, mm-hmm. that kind of thing that requires some sort of like performance, mm-hmm. as opposed to just a th- a three D or a two D character. Um, and programming. Mm-hmm. And it's also now too like uh, it's be it's not a huge trend yet, but it is. You, you've seen some of the blockbuster games come out and try to do this thing. Like, for instance, they had Kevin Spacey in... Um, uh, the one new, of the Call of Duty yeah. ones, yeah. Um, and so it was Kevin Spacey, like, his likeness as a video game character yeah. playing this role, um, which is interesting because, mm-hmm. you know, one of the advantages, I think, of having um, a digital production is that you don't need to have someone's likeness. You can have their voice and even their mannerisms, but you don't need to have their face. And so it's an interesting idea to me that... Mm-hmm. A medium that doesn't require a face might want to take advantage of it for whatever good they think that does them. Well, it has been in uh, games have been doing this, doing it for a while at least, as we've gotten more realistic. Where they did, they do take, um, they get models like character models, mm-hmm. and they try to base that character off of the. When I say model, I don't literally mean a model, although mm-hmm. sometimes they are. Yeah. But a lot of times they aren't. They're mm-hmm. just actors, and usually like lower rent mm-hmm. um, actors. Not to disrespect anyone, mm. but um, stick them in a mocap suit and have them walk around for a bit, and then base your animations off of that. That sort of thing. Yes, and then also sometimes you base the face of the character off of them too. You bring mm. in someone and you just model it. Mm. I mean, that's been going on in art circles too, in uh, comic books, for example. Alex Ross, mm-hmm. um, who's even he's more of like a painter that does like comic book work. Okay, and I don't know if you're, you're familiar with his work. I'm not, um, but uh, he's actually relatively well known in comic circles. He's very a very good artist. He has co- almost like a Norman Rockwell quality hmm. that. 
rings any bells for you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um, he will bring an actor. So we'll have someone, for example, dress up in a Batman suit hmm. and then draw, and like draw, I should, say, I should say paint, but he does. He draw, he sketches them and then paints over it. Okay. Um, and it looks great. I mean, nice. he can do really realistic drawings uh, that look almost like pictures or photographs, I should say, but um, it has a different quality to it than some other comic artwork that is, you know, it's more imaginative. And, yeah. yeah. So video games, I think for a while, have been moving more in this realistic direction. Not all of them, obviously, not say Nintendo, a lot of yeah. Nintendo's art, but a lot of them have been moving in this more realistic artwork direction. And part of that is being driven by including performance, such as voice acting, but mm-hmm. also uh, performance capture and trying to base off of a real character. Mm-hmm. Um, we talked a little bit about a bit a few weeks ago about um, the actor that plays Quiet. I believe mm-hmm. it's uh, Stephanie Justin, I think her name is, mm-hmm. um, who went to um, you know she went to try out to be the character over at Konami, and she sort of realized very quickly it was a Metal Gear mm-hmm. try because she is a gamer. So it's kind of cool that that she was able to land the role. But it's like this whole thing where um, you know the, the character is basically based off of her. It's, like, mm-hmm. it's a mod- they did a model of her, and like it's. If you see a picture of her and you see it next mm-hmm. to Quiet's face, mm-hmm. you're like, oh, yeah. You can see the resemblance. Yeah, yeah. it's like, it's, oh, yeah. It's, it's not like 100% there, but it's it's very close. Right. Well, we're not yet at photorealistic yeah. and <laughs> realism in games, but we're we're closer. Mm-hmm. Um, what are your thoughts on performance in games? I mean, what was, let me ask you this. Let's start out. Let's be a little more organized about it. What was the first experience you had with any sort of performance in games? So, I mean, mm-hmm. it could be... Back in the '90s, where they had that period where they did um, motion capture video for yeah. games, literally it was just a oh, video, full motion like, video, yeah, yeah. full motion video. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Or it could be voice acting or anything. What was the first sort of that you can that you remember that made an impact, uh, even if it's not the first? I'm trying to think because there are probably some games that I played that I at the time, especially I didn't mm-hmm. know were motion captured, and yet they were. Um, it's Mad Dog McCree, isn't it? Uh, you were a huge Mad Dog McCree fan. Oh, of totally. Radio. No, I had no, no idea. Um, <laughs> but. Um, let me think. I think actually one of the things I do remember in kind of that like '90s style of full motion video adventure games, um, where they had kind of like the very artificial. It was, it was photographed, and you could sort of tell that they took a picture, and then they had like one or two elements that would move, and so it was like very. Sort it's of, like a digitized yeah picture. It was of um, kind of uncanny valley sort of animation. It's because the 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 quality they would actually film a video. In other yeah. words, the one shot, it, it, it would originally be a video, but yeah. they couldn't They couldn't upload it as a video. So mm-hmm. it was like, it ended up being super pixelated, low quality. Yeah. But anyway, go ahead. Um, but I think there was a, like a little language learning program that I tried messing around with mm-hmm. when I was like 10 or 12. Um, it was supposed to be learning German. And so I skipped over the first few, like I, the first few discs worth of lessons and just went to the game. And basically the game is supposed to be this like immersive thing where you have to, have conversations with people and try to solve this mystery by like asking them questions in German and they respond back in German. Mm. Um, and basically what I ended up doing is cause I wasn't even trying to learn German. I just switched mm-hmm. it on to like, always oh, just give me the English. And so I played the whole game in English. Uh, but that was, I think probably the first time that I noticed because it was full motion video, like actual performers appearing in a video game. Were you impressed? Because for, there was a period in the nineties where full motion video was like, it was the thing to do. There it, were a bunch it, of games that did it. Honestly, um, and like this is partially because I didn't get to do a lot of gaming in general when I was that young, mm-hmm. but um, it didn't really strike me one way or the other. It's kind of like, okay, these are the graphics. You know, It didn't really strike me. It's like, oh, man, look how realistic. It was just like, okay, it's the graphics. There was a period where I know, um, I know Sierra, an adventure game company, they did that for some of their games like Phantasmagoria, uh, Gabriel Knight 2, um, they had this like run of of games. There there was other um, shivers. There was a few others where basically it was like a normal. It was it was initially just a first person game, mm-hmm. and then they would have these full motion videos as part of it. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was uh, some other companies that did. I was joking around about Mad Dog McCree. It was a on the 3DO. It was like a um, what do you call those games where you're on rail like an on rail shooter where you yeah. got like a gun and you're shooting, but it's basically a video of like mm-hmm. little cowboy dudes and it was. Pretty terrible game, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, it was it was comically bad. Mm. Um, those sort of games were some of my first experience oh. with it. Mortal Kombat, um, they, like the original Mortal Kombat's, like they were all photographs. They turned into the graphics of the game, or at least the the characters were. Yeah, and and I think I want to say that was um, oh, I'm, I'm forgetting the name of it, where you take a video and then you trace over the frames. 
It might have been, yeah. Which they did for their original They, 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 they version, somehow converted it, yeah. Where but, I, I'm not sure if it was direct video. Mm-hmm. I think it might have been that animation technique where you just take a video and you draw over it. But that's actually, mm-hmm. uh, that's, I think that would count. So something mm-hmm. like, for example, the original Prince of Persia, mm-hmm. even though it didn't look anything like that, mm-hmm. I mean, but he literally took, uh, Jordan Mechner took videos of, you know, people running and jumping and climbing, uh-huh. and then he would just go back and trace over mm-hmm. frames and then, like, use that digital it's digital actually a technique digital. i've considered using a few times before when i've needed to do um i don't do a lot of animation but what i have had to sorry rotos- i just remember yeah. the name it's called yeah. rotoscoping uh yeah using rotoscoping or something along those lines like even just a reference because mm-hmm. i'm i'm not the sort of animator who can just be like oh i i know exactly how this looks i'm sure a lot of animators at least start off needing to mm-hmm. see references in order to animate properly mm-hmm. um but then i know that you kind of get to a point too where you're able to just sort of draw it because you know how people move well enough it's kind of um Rotoscoping is kind of a dirty word among mm-hmm. some animators. Mm-hmm. I don't know if there's you, you're aware of the Disney controversy where um, early Disney movies were considered animated so well. I'm talking like things like Snow White, Pinocchio, that there was talk of uh, there was accusations that they used rotoscoping to get the animation to be so fluid. Mm-hmm. And of course, the Disney animators at the time were offended. Yeah. You know, if, no, we did not do this. It's like, and, believe us, <laughs> we spent a lot of time making it look this way. But still to this day, mm-hmm. there's people that say, no, they, they couldn't have gotten to look like this without rotoscope. It's just mm-hmm. kind of like a hot topic. So some animators will basically kind of say, um, you know, sort of against rotoscoping for that reason. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a little bit controversial. It really isn't in games, by the way, because we, I mean, what what is motion capture? Motion capture is... Basically, it's rotoscoping uh, in for the digital space. Yeah. Instead of like actually going in into like a three D program and, and making the animation yourself, mm-hmm. you're just capturing someone actually performing mm-hmm. it and then translating that into a, onto a three D model. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I've seen people work too with um, mocap and uh, uh, keyframing is the term for like the alternative to mocap in three D animation is when you set keyframes, then it auto. Mm-hmm. Fills the in between. Same um, thing with, I mean, it, it, that's, it comes from traditional animation. Too. Yeah, where you have, frame you, have a, you have yeah. a keyframer, and then you have people the who tweeners. The, the tweeners, yeah, yeah, in betweeners who fill the frames in between each keyframe. But um, and there are like pros to cons to both. Like usually, kind of the ideal thing to do for games, um, to kind of the best of both worlds, is to do motion capture to get the base, but then do enough keyframing to sort of have it return back to that loop point properly, or to sort of return back to the neutral thing from which you can then lead into the next animation. That's well, the ideal. Mm-hmm. And to add more expression, because mm-hmm. one of the things that, that you can do is you can add more, you can do a mocap for the basic motion and mm-hmm. then go back in and then using, you know, manipulate the animation and make it more expressive because if, if, if ever you watch like a really good cartoon, there's more to it than just realistic motion. It also mm-hmm. has this exaggerated quality, yeah. this exaggeration that it, makes it so much more interesting. I, I'm reminded at. of a, a thing I watched um, when Guitar Hero World War first came out. Mm-hmm. I was like really excited about it and so I was watching all of the... Um, the behind-the-scenes videos that they were releasing. And I think that was the first time in the series they brought in um, actual rock stars to Mm -hmm. um, do mocap and to do, like, you know, lend their likenesses to the the game. Um, And so it was interesting because you bring in the actual rock star, but then the director's having to tell them to play up the way they act because they really want to evoke them in the motion and not just in their likeness, you know? So the, uh, so the so, people that were recording it were just too lazy to have their <laughs> anime, animator team go back and actually do that themselves. Yeah, who knows? I think it was like, I think it was Slash who was saying, it's like, yeah, oh, yeah. They're, they're trying to get me to like bring out this guy named Slash, you know, because like they kept, they probably kept telling him, it's like, you know, don't just do X, do X more, you know, like really, Mm -hmm. really like emphasize it and sort of like bring it out, make it distinctive, um, which is an interesting thing, uh, in performance. And I think, I think video game has a lot of stuff to do, or, um, I think video games have a lot of similarities in this regard to theater. Um, whereas like in film, this probably exists to a certain extent, extent as well, but because film, you can get up close and you can like see more minutia, you can really focus on things you want to focus on. In theater, you have to be performing so that everyone in the theater, no matter where they are, mm-hmm. and especially from the distance, because normally you're not like right up in the actors' faces, um, they have to be able to tell what it is you're doing. And so you have to exaggerate. You have to you have to walk differently. You have to sit differently. You have to carry yourself differently on stage um, because of the the requirements of the medium. So you're saying essentially, and I, that's a good point. Actually, I didn't think of that one, but. Um, because in a video game, outside of a cutscene at least, mm. you're not seeing necessarily your environment, other characters in the environment, or your own character in a way that um, 
is necessarily you know conducive to a film performance. Mm-hmm. Oh, for sure. You kind of um, have this this farther back view where you sort of have to put a little more theatrical spin on it. There's also a ludic consideration in the sense that in games, telegraphing, for example, in action games, is very mm-hmm. important. Um, so you're not just doing an attack the way you would do an attack in real life. You have to do the exaggerated wind up and sort of telegraph the move. And then usually the attack itself is much quicker than it would be in real life because you're trying to make it quick and snappy and you know frame perfect that sort of thing. Um, so even the way you have to carry yourself vo- or doing performance acting for a game mm-hmm. um, is quite different from the way you would do it, um, even if you're doing like a cool choreographed fight scene uh, in a film. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I, I totally agree. So, so in terms of um, the actual, like, let's get an actor in here, let's get a voice actor in here, let's get, let's bring someone in that is going to either do a voice or do motion capture to make a character move look a certain way. Um, let's talk a little bit. You want to talk about the good first, and then end on the bad, or talk about the bad and then the good. I'm more uh, makes it all in. I, I, well, kind of however it flows. I think I, I tend okay. to be more a uh, give me the bad news first kind of guy. Okay. But uh, well, some of the bad stuff. Let's do some bad. Okay. So one of the things that that I've noticed ever since the rise of voice acting is that the the depth of story that you can have in an RPG, in particular, has gone way down. Mm. And the amount of choice that you can have in terms of branching story paths has mm-hmm. gone way down. Yeah, and, and we've a, talked about this before yes, on the podcast. Yeah. And a big reason for that really is because they're trying to they're trying to use voices for everything. And the mm-hmm. more they try to add voices, at a certain you can't record that much. You mm-hmm. can't have people record all these different lines, mm-hmm. and you can't have all this different audio because you one it takes up a lot of space, mm-hmm. and two it takes a lot of time to record all of that. A lot of money. A lot of time and a lot more money. Whereas yeah. opposed to if you just have text written on a page. Like, Planescape Torment is a game that nowadays you really can't do a game with that level of content and have it all be voice acted because mm-hmm. it's just too much content. And there are times, too, where you have kind of like the, the happy medium of the RPG. Like, a lot of JRPGs would do this, where you have the voice acted cutscenes mm-hmm. and, like, the important scenes are all voice acted, but then you have a lot of just sort of, like, text stuff yeah. in the and, overworld. And Planescape actually did some of that, too. They mm-hmm. had a little bit of voice work here and there. Um, there were some moments in cutscenes where you have a few voices. They had some obviously you had some grunts and things like that. And occasionally you would say your character would say something related to what's going on. Like they'd call something out in battle based mm-hmm. on what's happening. Mm-hmm. Baldur's Gate did that too. Baldur's yeah, Gate yeah. two and other series that did really well story wise. Yeah, call outs. Mm-hmm. Um, but they didn't do everything, and it's limiting. I mean, it's one of the things we talked about with um, you know Telltale is really guilty of this mm-hmm. where. Perhaps if they weren't so focused on having everyone... And Telltale's a great example of performance, because the mm-hmm. whole thing is is they're basically presenting this like it's a television mm-hmm. series or a movie. It's very mm-hmm. much based on these characters are, are basically actors, and they all have voices, and they're all supposed to be as realistic as possible. Well, the problem is this limits you in the game to where you only can really have a few choices, and mm-hmm. quotation marks, yeah. and you all come back to the same bottleneck, because to actually do all of that, that movement, mm-hmm. all of that, like, you know... All that little extra movement in my character stuff. Well, even just the fact that you have, to, you have to program the camera work and stuff like that and the actual motions for the cutscenes. Yeah. Um, having well, too the whole game many, is basically cutscenes. Yeah. In, in and a way. Especially given the fact cutscenes. that they're, they're trying to crank these out so quickly, also. Uh, I mean, they, they, they go slower than kind of what's, yeah. what's advertised, but at the same mm-hmm. time, um, like if they really took their time with it and didn't. Part of the reason they do do it episodically is because they want to be able to update later stuff based on yes. feedback from the early ones. Um, but if they say weren't concerned with that and really just took their time, I'm sure that like you know, say if there's like the full length Telltale game, which is not their model, but if just like the sixty dollar, I buy this game and say it's maybe like a ten hour game with just tons of branches, I'm sure they could do it. It's just the fact is I, the, the, re- the the production realities are such that yeah. they can't pull it off. I'm not so sure they. I'm not so sure they could. I mean, I'm not saying they couldn't theoretically, mm-hmm. but it's just like I don't think they could from a time standpoint. Oh sure. I think it would take them so long. Their mm-hmm. production cycle would be so long to make this. Mm-hmm. Like I'm talking like multiple years mm-hmm. to the point where it would no longer be. Yeah, like, they it, couldn't. It, they couldn't do it, it. It would be a blockbuster level game for a company that doesn't have blockbuster budgets. Well, but even if even if they did, I just don't think it'd be like, for example, because basically what they're doing, it's like in Metal Gear. We talk about you know Metal Gear has all these different cutscenes, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. It'd be like if the entire game was like those cutscenes. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, the, the Telltale doesn't have those same production values, but in terms of like you have actors, there they're, you use have all these cinematic cameras, mm-hmm. and you have all everything is voiced. Mm-hmm. You do that, and you have you add in branching paths mm-hmm. all of a sudden. Yeah, 
we're talking about even if you say, oh, it's ten hours to play through it. Well, that's to play through it once, right? Mm-hmm. Well, even from a writing perspective, I can I can attest to. Oh, it was, oh yeah, of course. Like even just writing that much extra content takes forever. Yes, that's why the the, <laughs> the, the amount of dialogue yeah. and the amount of like actual text in Planescape Torment is so absurdly high because mm-hmm. there's like so many choices and there's like reactions to all those choices yeah. and how they impact impact everything else. Mm-hmm. Even in that. You know, there's, of course, a limit to how many choices that you have. But when you have something you throw in, you have to have all these performances with voices. It limits that mm-hmm. a lot. And if they could strip that away, say mm-hmm. we took that same model that, that, that um, some of these games have, when you strip all that away, mm-hmm. you strip out the performance, mm-hmm. and you just have the choices, how much more could you get out? Especially if you look at, say, strip out even the, even, even the animation performance and go straight into literally, like, like uh, interactive fiction. Mm-hmm. Go, in other words, just pure text, yeah. interactive fiction, mm-hmm. and how many more choices, and how many more, how much more, you know, you know, depth can you have there mm-hmm. from an narrative standpoint in terms of choice mm-hmm. and, and 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 player mm-hmm. um, agency. To kind of play devil's advocate on this point, though, um, I would argue that a lot of times the reason why we do have these performance-driven games mm-hmm. is because the vast majority of the audience buying it doesn't care if you have that much openness or if you have that much depth. I, I, um, I'd, I'd be weary for, of... For, for better or for worse, but just hear me out on no, this. No, no, I just meant I'd be wary of saying, like, vast majority. I think it's fair to just say, like, there's a there's a definitely a large market mm-hmm. for it. You basically have enough people who are buying the games for what they are that even if they kind of wish there was more depth, they don't mind that there isn't. Um, Mass Effect is an example, you know? Um... Playing through Mass Effect for the first time, like looking back on it, I do realize that there's a lot of stuff where I would have liked to see more branching and more depth and stuff mm-hmm. like that. But the first time through, and it's the same thing for me in Telltale games, where I never play a Telltale game twice, because then you realize just how little choice you have. Um, but the first time through, you can enjoy it as a really cool, like, more linear story. Um, kind of like to take the developer's story and have it be polished and cool and exciting and intriguing and, you know, to whatever extent you can affect the story or at least make you feel like you've you've been affecting the story. Um, there's, there's enough, there's enough draw. Like it's easier to sell people on, look how cool the performance is than on, Hey, we made the game look like it came from the Mm nineties, but it's because we get to let you do all this stuff. There's, there's going to be a more niche audience for that. No, there is. I think, I think part of it is, is what gets into like, the new gamer Mm -hmm. and just this there's definitely I think the rise of performance in games this is something that I've believed for a very long time Mm. has led to new people like new it it, it has grown the gaming Mm. audience sure and I don't necessarily think it's for the better and and not that I'm against having these games exist Mm -hmm. the problem is because now the audience is bigger companies can appeal more to that large audience and sort of ignore the, the the gamers that kind of came on their back, which is why I still really mm-hmm. like certain developers like Nintendo that mm-hmm. still try to sort of have sure. kind of play both sides, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, to to go a little bit in, in the good about performance, because I do think there is some good there. I do mm-hmm. think it allows you to tell, like you said, a good linear story mm-hmm. and, and, and that kind of thing. It's just that works really well for some genres mm-hmm. and for others it doesn't. Sure. I do think I for an RPG that, yeah. it's very limiting. Yeah. It's one of my problems with I mean, Mass Effect is a great example. I think the first one, um, I kind of enjoyed it, and it became a lot more cinematic, starting with the second one. Mm-hmm. Even the first one was, was a little bit much, but mm-hmm. the second especially really ramped it up mm-hmm. in terms of like cinematics. And really, uh, Dragon Age, you could say the same thing. Mm-hmm. The first one versus the second one. Yeah. Um, it really did ramp up that cinematic, um, which goes back into the performance. Mm-hmm. Um, interestingly, a game that gets a lot of flack for cinematics because it kind of was on the forefront for a lot of this was Metal Gear yeah and it really has actually done a good job I think of balancing cinematics and gameplay mm-hmm. most of the, the I, I'm talking specifically about five most of the performed content a lot of like the voice acting for instance you, you it's like Kiefer Sutherland is Snake like you half the time you wouldn't even know because Snake doesn't say much yeah most of his uh, most of his dialogue comes through in the briefing tapes um the cassette tapes which are totally optional you don't have to listen to those at all yeah um and so it's interesting that Metal Gear is kind of taking more of this approach of focus on the gameplay first and have a lot of extra content optionally mm-hmm. added on. Witcher does that too. Mm-hmm. Witcher has a lot of these. It, it kind of reminds me of Metal Gear in a way because it has these actually very you know high production uh, cutscenes mm-hmm. with uh, clearly you know they've, they've they've got some sort of models in there. I'm, I'm I'm assuming they do have some good animation, but but they have you know good voice acting that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But the, when you actually are playing the game, it's just kind of this sort of open world um, exploration, um, you know, combat, spells. It's a role playing game. Mm-hmm. I mean, but it just it also has the story behind it 
that is sort of driven by these performances. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely a right way and a wrong way. I mean, I don't know. It's a little harsh to say right and wrong. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to necessarily say... A lot say, of it's subjective. Right. Well, and not just that, but it's also genre-based. Like, mm -hmm. for example, with Telltale, I can appreciate what they do, and I think that they're interesting games from a story perspective. But it's to the point where, for me, te the Telltale games, even though I've enjoyed them, I've talked to things like walk The Walking Dead, at least season one, mm -hmm. and uh, The Wolf Among Us... They're, they're good, they're enjoyable experiences. Mm -hmm. I would hesitate to even call them games. That's how mm -hmm. much they've moved away from the game yeah. element and, and emphasized performance. And I say that yeah. not to put stink on them, mm -hmm. not to say, like, or stank on them. Yeah. Not, it's not to, like, insult them, not mm -hmm. to say, oh, they're not a game, haha. I, I can definitely, it's, it's I can definitely, say, it's, I can definitely understand yeah. labeling those more as, like, interactive narrative, interactive fiction, right. which, for me, I still classify those as games. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a lot more generous with my definition of mm -hmm. what a game can and, be. And, I mean, technically, interactive fiction usually is not considered a game. Like, I'm talking, you know, old-style inter interactive fiction is usually mm -hmm. not considered a game. Sure. It's usually considered interactive fiction. Mm -hmm. It's a separate thing. Yeah. Um, I, and I, I think, I think the definition of that's changed a bit over time. I think too, so too. But without no, getting too far yeah. off track. Yeah, I would say something like Telltale, Telltale experiences. I think are they're interactive narrative experiences, mm -hmm. and they're they can be they can be quite entertaining. But I don't. I wouldn't necessarily call them games. I don't know. Maybe I just expect I expect more control, and mm -hmm. I think a big part of the Telltale experience is the illusion of control. Sure, that's a big part of their experience, and mm -hmm. which is something that a lot of games have used for a long time. Um, it's just that I think that we we tend to forget a lot of the games, and even some of the games that do give you a lot of control also still have a lot of portions that are the illusion of control. No, no, that's very true. Mm -hmm. It's just with Telltale games, it's the entire experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is something actually that we touched on. I know you weren't um, in on the talk that Doc and I did about uh, Titan's Grave. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things we brought up there is this part, portion of the game, um, one, of the, one of the episodes of the series, episode 9 out of 10, um, was pretty much like they had stuff written out. It was like a dream sequence for each of the characters. Mm -hmm. um, and it took away a lot of the interactivity. There were a few choices they offered them. Um, and I think a lot of the choices were kind of false choices. Um, but one of the points that I made kind of in its defense is that to the person being offered the choice, even if it is a false choice, the fact that it is offered to you and you have to think about it turns it into something more than just saying, here's my action. You know, if that makes sense. Like, even just choosing, do I go left or do, do I go right? And you describe, like, what sort of surrounds the left path and the right path. They probably are both going to take you to the same location, but because you're having to choose, do I take left or do I take right, you're thinking about, why would I take this path or that path? And this, the fact that you're thinking about that engages you in the story in a way that you wouldn't necessarily get if you are simply... Um, watching or reading something. Now, granted, you can sort of put yourself in the character's shoes and mm -hmm. wonder what would I be thinking. No, in no, position. You, but, there is that element of like you know you get that little bit of extra, like you said. But mm -hmm. that's I mean that's the interactive element of it. Yeah, I just don't. I wouldn't necessarily say that's a game element. Mm -hmm. That's just that's adding interactivity. Sure. I think I think we can have. We're getting a little off topic with going more into like what games are, but mm -hmm. I guess it's related. Mm -hmm. But I think you can have an interactive experience without it necessarily being a game. Yeah. And there's nothing. There, there's still value there. Nothing mm -hmm. wrong with that. It's not like one is be a better experience than the other. What, mm -hmm. What's better is is really a personal call. Sure. Yeah. Um, you're right. There is something to be said about being able to like hide that. Mm -hmm. And but that but that kind of it does all kind of go back to performance mm -hmm. and what that really brings to the experience. I mean, even if you're just adding voice acting to go into that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Say even something like Planescape Torment or Baldur's Gate, just giving that little bit of extra. Oh, here's what your character sounds like. Mm -hmm. It adds that even when you're reading text, you sort of read mm -hmm. in their voice. Yeah. you kind of it, have it, a little it's background. Even, it's even like The Legend it's, of Zelda, where like you go talk to someone like, hur, hur, and so you kind of know that like that person's kind of talking like this. The whole, you know, like they're yeah. kind of like a goofy character right. as opposed to the person's like, hey, you know. Now they're talking like this. Mm -hmm. um, it just even that like little hint kind of gives you that extra little bit of characterization that changes the way you read it. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, I, I think so. There's there's definitely there's something there, and I think in terms of just the movement, mm -hmm. uh, the movement performance of it when we're talking about motion capture mm -hmm. specifically, um, there's some pretty neat stuff that's been done there. I know I know La Noir really tried to go really all in with uh, facial mm -hmm. motion capture. Mm -hmm. And uh, that studio that did that uh, doesn't exist anymore. I know mm -hmm. Rockstar you know, was mm -hmm. the, I guess, producer. Is that the the developer? I know. I don't. Well, but they. It was another studio that did all the facial publishers. Yeah, they may have just been the publisher. Mm -hmm. But um, 
I know that that studio kind of closed down from mm. what I was hearing. Yeah, the, the thing about that is that it kind of, it was fairly impressive on a small screen on an Xbox, mm-hmm. but I, when I went back to play it myself, like, several years later mm-hmm. on my PC, you can very clearly tell that it's just a full motion video pasted on to yeah. uh, a, a, fa- a, a head model, <laughs> and so it, it's distracting in a way because you mm-hmm. can tell that it's just a video and not, like point motion capture so let's let's talk a bit about about rockstar specifically because Mm. i think they've done actually they're one of if not my absolute favorite developers um and i think that one of the reasons for that is that they're able to incorporate gameplay and performance so well Mm. to the point where they're almost married to one another like it's almost the same experience i mean yes they have these little Mm cutscenes to them as well but it's almost like these they sort of enhance mm. the rest of the experience and I, what do you what do you think I, i've talked a lot about i mean games, having but. having not played a ton of rockstar games and i still need to finish 5 at some point mm. um but yeah, I mean, I, 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 my impression having played um, GTA, for example, is that a lot of the cutscenes really are just kind of like quick little bits of context that yeah. help to drive the story, and then you get right back into the gameplay. And so in that regard, um, mm-hmm. the performances are, you know, kind of good enough. But but also then, but also lots of voice acting. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, like, acting, you know, sure. they have tons and tons of characters, mm-hmm. and of, and. And I, I, they, like, I like their delivery for story, like yes. you know, GTA or L.A. Noir. when you're driving around, you kind of get more context as you're doing things. They don't like sort of make you sit through a cutscene doing nothing. They fold it into the rest of the gameplay. Have you not played, um, so was GTA 5 your first GTA? GTA 4 was my first GTA. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was not a fan of 4, but I love 5. Um, mm-hmm. Did you ever play Red Dead Redemption? I saw a lot of Red Dead Redemption, I haven't played it yet. Oh, I, need I, to. I really strongly recommend it. What mm-hmm. about uh, Bully? I've not played Bully. Surprisingly good game. Mm. It got a lot of flack for... Um, because the, it was about bullying. Or supposedly about but bullying. But it wasn't. Yeah. It actually, it was the opposite. Yeah, you're playing as a bully. It's like, just because the name says bully doesn't mean you play as the you, bully. You <laughs> actually play as a kid who yeah. unites every all of the rival factions in school. You're mm. actually like, even you're, though you're, you're... You're the peacemaker. You're a bad kid, quote. Mm. You act like a troublemaker, mm. supposedly. You actually are a united force in the school, and you mm. actually fight the bullies and stop them, and you have... it's. It's actually done really well. Hmm. Um, I actually highly recommend Bully if you can. I think it's you can get it on. Um, There's probably the Xbox, version. yeah, the PSN or the Xbox Arcade or Steam for mm-hmm. really cheap. Nice. Like I remember one time I picked it up for like two or three bucks because it was on sale. Nice. So I just, uh, strongly uh, recommend it. Yeah. Um, if you have an X, do you have an Xbox 360? I've got a PS4. Oh, and a PS3. Oh, okay. Cause, yeah, I, I would let you borrow a Red Dead, but I don't have a version mm-hmm. in that. Yeah. in that format. Um, but yeah, I'm a huge fan. I think that in terms of, of performance, they do a really good job of mixing in these short little cutscenes for context, like you said, mm-hmm. and then having, um, you know, backing it up with voice acting and mm-hmm. a really good sound design, I think is a big part of their experience. Mm-hmm. Um, cause I'm, 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 I'm someone, I'm someone personally, and I think it's important to do yeah. at least a little bit of that context stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm one of those people who likes Metal Gear for its cutscenes. No, I, know some I think they've, I think they've got some good ones. Um, yeah. but I need at least a little bit of context and some good context. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know there are a lot of games that try to be super minimalistic. We talked a little bit about, um, uh, Transistor and the way that they are like, are very hands off with the cutscenes. They just say like they they don't even like really have a lot of conversation while you play. They just kind of have like little hints of things that slowly. But they have a lot of voice acting. In that oh, game. they do, they do. But the the thing about it though is that I need um, a a certain level of that context because when I'm playing a game, define, define context. You don't. You, mm. When you say context, though, yeah. you're talking more about. I, I want to story elements. You're not necessarily saying you have to have I, voice I, acting. Is that mm, sure? Yeah. I mean, just I, to I, preface that. Yeah. No, I'm not saying I need voice acting necessarily. I need enough knowledge of the world and of the situation mm. and of my character's motivation to sort of have that because I there's there's something about not having a motivation simply playing for fun Mm -hmm. um depending on the game I can still do it but there's sometimes where it just doesn't appeal to me if I don't if I can't kind of get in character so to speak I sort of see you know even if I'm not thinking about it this way I see every game that I play kind of like a role-playing game uh and I'm thinking about what I'm doing in the context of what the character is thinking and going through and that sort of stuff and so with Transistor, while there were some cool elements and they kind of do this neat thing where they slowly reveal details about the world, but a lot is still left vague. Uh, and they kind of hint at, it's like, they took your voice. We're going to get back at them for that. It's like, why did they take your voice? You know, like, what were you doing? And they slowly reveal all this stuff. But it's like, I don't, like, I, I just because you put this character in front of me and I controlled them and you mm-hmm. told them they're going to pay for this, but they told me I'm going to pay for this. It's like, why? 
You know, I, I just that that game was one, and there, it's not the only one. I'm just kind of picking on it because it's a recent example I can think well, of that didn't provide me mm-hmm. adequate context to help me drive through the game. If that makes sense. But what about games like, for example, Super Mario Bros., where there really is almost no. <laughs> that one kind of gets a pass for me because it is uh, old school. And it's also, and again, nostalgia glasses are kind of coming to play here. But like you know, even really, even, though, even Super I, Mario Galaxy. Because I would just, say, yeah, that's what I'm saying. I don't like, know about the, nostalgia goggles. I think the, those are legitimate. There's just enough. Games. There's just enough. I mean, the, as games, they're excellent. But yeah. story wise, like I don't go to Mario for story. No, no, no. no that's I'm not, not saying you should. Um, but you know, say Super Mario Galaxy, for instance. You're and in, you're in this peaceful kingdom. Mm-hmm. Um, you get up to the castle, and then, like it suddenly starts getting attacked. And Bowser kidnaps the princess again and flies off, and you chase them after or chase after them. But it's it's very clearly set up. You're going through these levels to eventually rescue the princess. And there's even like little dialogue snippets, mm-hmm. uh, like little pop up bubbles that say like, "Here's kind of the situation, yeah. and uh, you're going to have to work through the situation in this way to get to the end." But they give you enough guidance that it's kind of like, "Okay, I get who I am, what I'm after, and uh, I'm sort of working through the game this way." Yeah. And so in that way. Um, you don't need performance mm-hmm. to make that happen, but performance is a great way of adding that extra level of excitement. And, you know, it, well, but, if you're going to have performance, I want it to be good. Yeah. So it's not just kind of like eye rolly, like, oh, that's definitely a developer doing that voice, yeah. you know, like some of the old. Some of the older games. Yeah. No, I think, I think, yes, perfor- I think it's better to say performance can add something mm-hmm. to it, not necessarily that it does, mm-hmm. because I don't think necessarily adding that performance those performance pieces to Mario would necessarily mm. improve the experience. Yeah, sure. But and at the Mario, same time, again, that, at, that's one it's, that's like, it's there's, the game there's, itself. There's sufficient genre. context, it's a low context, right. but it's sufficient. Right, but then if you say, for example, in GTA, if you take out all of that voice acting and you take mm. out all that stuff, you get a very different experience. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's not, like, I don't know if you played, for example... Um, some of the early 2D ones, or, which I didn't, or mm. Chinatown Wars, which I did. I played did. a tiny bit of Chinatown. Yeah, and that one, like, it took out a lot of that stuff, mm-hmm. and it was a very different game. Mm-hmm. You don't get that sort of, like, immersive experience. Yeah. Like, you get, like, so little text bubbles different. that pop up and say, right. like, here's, you're like, oh, it's your uncle, and no, go after those people, but there's there's the distance from it. Right. The fact that you're looking down on As it. As opposed to feeling like you're in yeah. the story. It's like, not as immersive. I think if you're if you're trying to get into someone who has is living a life of crime, you have to be in that life of crime and not kind of removed from it as you are, say, in Chinatown Wars. Mm-hmm. Um, because it's when you're in that that you understand what motivation people might have to try to get out of it or to try to fight through it. It's like, I am being threatened right now, and that's why I'm fighting back. Not, uh, I get points because I shoot these people. Yeah. No, I think a better a better version of Chinatown Wars was Sleeping Dogs. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, Except that was actually in China. Hong Kong. Uh, Hong Kong, yeah. Yeah. Um, China, war, China wars, not China yeah. Town wars. Um, yeah, no, I, I think so. I think what we're kind of getting at, or sort of beating around the bush on, is that performance. I think is good when used right, mm-hmm. but we need to be careful not to try to shoehorn it into every gaming sure. experience. Yeah. Because I think I think Call of Duty is a good example, in my opinion, mm-hmm. of trying to shove that into say a, a first person shooter experience can be very. You gotta be very careful with that. Like, mm-hmm. I think New Order did a pretty good job with it, mm-hmm. but a lot. In all honesty, I think in Call of Duty, it's nothing but a negative. And I think me. I think we've brought this up on the podcast before, and this is definitely mm-hmm. technology that's way out. We're kind of slowly working up to it, but I think what will be interesting is, for example, for RPGs, if you want to have a fully voice acted game, but without having to hire the people to do all of that stuff, is eventually to get some sort of computer generated voice that can have. Like you can program in intonation and inflection. And we have that like already. That. It's called Microsoft Sam. Yeah. It's brilliant. Yeah, no. He's my friend. <laughs> um, it's like we're, we're slowly working toward that with such mm-hmm. things as Microsoft Sam uh, and other sort of computerized voices, you know, Siri and all that sort of stuff, Cortana. Um, but those are still very clearly artificial. They can't give a dramatic performance. Um, but I think eventually we might get cl- like close enough to a dramatic performance with computers that we can't afford to have generated performances that can fill up entire games like this and because it's not recordings that you're having to fit onto the disc it's just like here's the program and it's going to run like this it's it's generated 
It's um, an algorithm. You, yeah, it's an algorithm. You can have it just coded into the game, and it takes up a lot less space, and mm-hmm. still it gives you. So, so now we've gone full circle back mm-hmm. to the um, the voice acting strike. There will be no strike because there will be no voice acting <laughs> jobs in the future, according <laughs> to Chris. In the year three thousand ninety nine, I, I don't think that I, it's kind of like human pilots are never going to go out of style because. Like, I'm not so sure about that, actually. Yeah. Drones are dr- we're in the age of drones, they're but, but they're still they're still manned though. And I mean, you're, granted, you can have AIs that can do stuff like that, but there's also there, there's a human element that is like some people might argue that like we can make anything happen in technology given enough time and resources and research. Uh, but I think there is in just about anything a a human element that you can only get from humans who are masters of their craft. Uh, and I think that's true in game design. I think it's true in voice acting, uh, you know, programming, writing. I mean, you name it. Cool. So. I, I actually agree with that statement. I think that's a good way to end it. Mm. So I know we kind of we kind of jumped all over the place a little bit there, but mm. I think it was an interesting discussion. I hope I hope you all enjoyed the discussion as well. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone for joining us for episode number forty-seven of the BackwardCompatible.com podcast. I'm Chris, and I'm Jim, and we'll see you next time. We want you to join the discussion on our website backward-compatible.com You bring unique perspective and dialogue makes everyone better. Leave a comment in our podcast section and if it's good, one of the crew members will respond to it. This week, tell us what performance in games means to you and how it can improve. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. We're compatible.